All right. Welcome back. What's Craft going on? Brew Film Review. What's going on? We are we're here to get drunk and watch films. <laughs> My average weekend activity. Hey, I mean that's every uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, right? I mean, yes, <laughs> maybe no. It, it might be that much to try to get through as many movies as we have to get yeah. through this <laughs> podcast. It's it's tough. It's tough. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. Well, uh, if you've been with us this long, I don't think I need to go too deep into it. But obviously, we There's talk a... about craft brews and we talk about films, mainly the Oscars versus the box office of you know each year. So, let's start off with beer. Mr. Anthony, the beer man. <laughs> I can cut that part. No, Mr. Anthony, fine. the beer man. Let's go. Uh, so, this is what we got. I grabbed um, a brewery out of Oregon for, for today. Uh, this is Deschutes. They are out of Bend, Oregon. Um, this is a new beer. I, I haven't actually had this from them. So, this will be a shared shared new experience. Um, I like that they, they typically do, um, like your standard pale ales, porters and stuff like that, but they're, Mm -hmm. they're known for, uh, West coast or very citrusy style IPAs. And this is a, it's very heavy on the tropical notes. So it's going to have pineapple, mango, um, very, very citrusy forward. Okay. This is actually kind of cool. Uh, I see on the back, it actually has like the tasting notes, Mm -hmm. like a little grading scale. It's full of the tropical. Yes. It's, 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 It's the tropics. Uh, two out of five citrus, three out of five bitter, and four out of five crisp, crispy, crisp, crispy. And, and I like the little uh, the little like a uh, guy, <laughs> the coconut guy uh, yeah. that's reclining <laughs> with the sunglasses. And that's the, that's, and a, that's a hop flower actually. <laughs> oh, a hop flower. That's a hop. Oh, flower. sorry, sorry. I saw the top mm-hmm. and a little coconut top, and then I didn't even think about the fact that the bottom is not the coconut. Mm-hmm. Don't yeah, this, worry, this I, I've never claimed now. to be smart. <laughs> that, no, I I I'd like to shoots quite a bit. Um, they don't really do. A lot of like super like strong beers. So mm-hmm. like like this one's six point five percent. It's it's kind of roughly in the middle. So you can have a handful and you won't like regret it the next day. Mm-hmm. And so like if you crack open some for a football game or something like that, you're you'll be good to go. Well, speaking of cracking open, you want to oh, do yes. three, two, one, go. Yes. <laughs> Synchronized. Now before I take a swig here, um, did you go with a? Was this just a random one you decided to choose, or is it the fact that last time you, I believe you brought an IPA and I actually was able to finish it? You you somewhat enjoyed it, so I'm kind of like I'm kind of sort of dialing in your your tastes a little bit. I mm-hmm. think um, this this one's more on like I said on the citrus side. I know you like citrusy type of stuff. Yeah, pineapple's my jam, <laughs> but it's but it's an IPA, Especially so it may be pineapple. on the bitter side, which you don't like. Yeah. So we'll we're we're kind of dialing things in a little sweet. bit. Well, I was gonna say sweet and sour, but <laughs> yeah, but enjoy. Yeah, it's got a it's got a bite to it. It's got that IPA taste. It's got a little bite to it. Not as much citrus as I was expecting, especially since it's like five tropical, but I guess it's only two citrus. So what makes it tropical if it's not as strong in the citrus? Um, two different things. Citrus is like um, oranges, grapefruits, that type of thing. This is more pineapple, mango ish. See, I'm not picking up the pineapple. I get it a little bit. But I normally drink that. Like, my palate's not like, you know, the chef's palate where I eat something. I'm like, it's got a little bit of nutmeg. And like, I'm not mm-hmm. that person. Um, and when I have stuff with pineapple and it's like strong mm-hmm. pineapple. So like I'm having to hunt through it to try to find yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not as prevalent as I was expecting, but I, I can taste it. Well, I don't love it. But of course, we know I'm not a huge beer person, which is why part of why we're doing this. I feel like I'm going to be able to finish this one too. All right. Um, I feel like the one we had last time, uh, I enjoyed a little bit better. But I think I'll still be able to finish this one. That was just a straight IPA too. I know, because I've had other IPAs, and I was just like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was at the bottle shop, and they had one of my favorites. Um, it's from a brewery in Oklahoma um, called Hoptometrist. <laughs> and i like that name it, it's so it's a double ipa it's incredibly piney um okay. i love it i think you would vomit <laughs> <laughs> potentially <laughs> we'll save that for the patreon no? <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that's the outtakes that's the b-roll <laughs> we'll save that for the, the the super chats and super thanks <laughs> watch jeff throw up beer <laughs> thanks thanks kind donor no it's, it's actually quite funny that you brought 
this one here that has like you said like the pineapple and mango because i uh ran out of my cola product mm. <laughs> um so i couldn't make any of my like long island iced teas or anything um i ran out of my black cherry rum and i've not restocked that either so i without that or the cola product how dare you um but i was like hey this is what i call the shit that's left in your fridge <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to call this the uh the random random hour. What is that anyway? Uh it is a Bang Mix Hard Seltzer Mango Bango. So yeah, that's what I was getting to. <laughs> it's funny you brought this that has pineapple and mango when this is a Mango Bango. Mango Bango. <laughs> and the the mango is a lot stronger in this one. <laughs> so it's an Alka Pop sort of. <laughs> Pretty much. Um like most hard seltzers I've had have been like it's essentially, you know, seltzer water with just like the tiniest hint of flavor. Mm-hmm. This one's essentially a soda. <laughs> That's it's it's nuts what what seltzers done to the like the craft market in the last several years because yeah. it wasn't like a thing and then yeah. now it's everywhere. Yes, it is. It's it's super cheap to make. It's just what's the difference between seltzer and tonic? Uh, that's a good question. I think they're roughly the same. Yeah, like um, because you have uh, seltzer water, which like is that tonic? I, I don't know. Tonic water? Or is that something different? I don't know. I've always heard gin and tonic, obviously, and right. I've seen you can buy tonic water and everything like that. But I'm like, is it the same as seltzer? Because I thought it was just tonic. It's just bubbly water. I've I've had a gin and tonic, and it wasn't bubbly. So I'm assuming oh, wasn't? it wasn't oh, okay. seltzer water. My bad. Actually, that would lead me to believe that they are two, in fact, yeah, different yeah. things. <laughs> if tonic is not bubbly, then it's probably different. <laughs> um, so I don't know. It's just... It's... Blues, clues, blues, clues. All right. <laughs> No, it's it. They're super easy and super cheap to make because you have water. You add your flavorings. Water bubbles. <laughs> and well, and uh, at, you add ethyl alcohol to get whatever kind you want. Like that's mm-hmm. what six percent, seven percent, five, five. Um, so you get that dialed in, and then you carbonate it, can it, and throw it out. Yeah. And then it, it's like I said, super cheap to make. Yeah. Well, the funny thing, the reason I have this is the fact that um, I used to drink. Bang energy drinks, but they're just there's so much caffeine. They taste delicious, mm-hmm. but there's just so much caffeine. I was like, I can't keep doing this. Like, so I gave them up. Start starting uh, getting the heart pitters. <laughs> well, I never had to get that point, but I'm just like, they, they taste good enough that you want to drink more than one. And um, to me, I'm like, you can't have more than one of those a day because then you're starting to risk stuff. And even one a day is a little, mm, yeah, because there's so much caffeine in them. Um, and I just happened to see this God, months and months and months ago when we were walking through a liquor store buying other stuff. God, that makes it sound like I'm like at the liquor store, just like I'm shopping, you know. Um, Don't, I, guess I am. I but. feel personally attacked. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I just saw that and I was like, oh, Bang's making a seltzer thing now. I wonder what that's going to be like. And I, it does say caffeine free. So I was like, oh, yeah, I'll try one of those. Um, and I mean, I think Bang has caffeine free energy drinks too, but whatever. Um, but then it just sat in the the liquor cabinet just for like the ever. last six months or something like that and since <laughs> not, i didn't have stuff fresh. i was kind of like hey i've got that i'll drink it That'll and work. it's actually not bad uh, it, <laughs> it's, it's pretty damn good and no like energy drink like monster has their own seltzer out now and mm. everybody's like there's Ma- mountain dew hard seltzers and sonic drive-in has their own seltzer line too it's <laughs> it's, it's 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 getting to the point of oversaturation i think <laughs> Everybody's trying to jump on the white claw bandwagon. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Eventually, well, that that will that train's going to come off the rails. Yeah, potentially. Um, it's going to get oversaturated. Yeah. But Just my opinion, though. No, I, no. Then again, I'm I'm not a professional in the business, so what do I know? <laughs> well, more than me, because I don't know shit about this stuff. But hey, I'm trying it. But hey, what do you say? We get into some movies. Ah, uh, yes, that would probably be a good idea. Let's 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 do that. <laughs> All right, so today we are going through uh, the years 1930. Um, not the year we're living in right now, but <laughs> the <laughs> movies we're looking at are from 1930. <laughs> uh, specifically, the 1930 Oscars. Yes. Um, so just to recap, the movie that we had to watch, because it is the 1930s Best Picture winner at the uh, Academy Awards, is All Quiet on the Western Front. Specifically, the one made in 1930. Yeah, they've they've remade that one several times. I know. There was 1930. Like, there was one in the 60s. There was actually one that just came out. One. Yeah, yeah, just recently. So I just want to make sure that anyone that's going to watch it and then follow the podcast knows the right one. Um, the Big House from 1930. Uh, and I don't know why I keep saying 1930, but and then we have the Divorcee. Now, 
those are the three films we're going to be talking about. All Quiet on the Western Front we had to watch because we choose to watch the winner. Uh, and then we pick from some of the runners up and we chose The Big House and The Divorcee. Mm -hmm. um, I believe I chose The Big House and you chose The Divorcee or... No, maybe it was the other way around. Ah, I, I don't recall. It was... <laughs> we, we, we pick these, and then like a month later, we get around to watching them, and so yeah, it's, it's it, hard it, to remember who picked what. Stuff, stuff runs, it, it just kind of like falls out. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, but let's start with the winner, All Quiet on the Western Front. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so that is directed by Lewis Milestone. It actually had a production budget of $1.2 million, uh, based on what I found. Stars, I'm going to mess up some of these names, but Lou Ayres, as, Ayres? maybe, A-Y-R-E-S, as Paul, uh, Louis Wolheim as Cat. You, you might you might remember him from The, Al or, uh, the Alibi. He played the, uh, one of the, he played the Scarcy, the older Scarcy brother. I don't remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, John Ray as Himmelstoss. Himmelstoss. Uh, and Arnold Lucy as Professor Cantorek. Um, obviously, there's other people in there, but these are the main characters we kind of deal with. Um, the synopsis is a German youth eagerly enters World War I, but his enthusiasm wanes as he gets a first-hand view of the horror. Um, so before you actually start jumping into the movie, I've had a couple little facts that I found here. Um, so apparently the, the film was banned in Germany, of it, course. It, it absolutely was, yes, for being anti-war. <laughs> uh, yeah, I found it was, it was banned in Germany uh, by the Nazi minister of the interior, Wilhelm Frick, mm -hmm. on the grounds that it uh, didn't, it represented Germans as cowards. Yeah, it, that, so like, like you said, this came out in 1930 and then the Nazi party started coming up right around then. Yeah, right so at the same time. Yeah. Totally makes sense. I think it, like, it, like they started like right before that and they started getting like power like right afterwards and yeah. everything, yeah. Um, and then, funnily enough, so they banned it because, you know, it was representing German as cowards. But I guess also in Poland, it was also banned. Uh, it had a censorship board because it was uh, pro-German. So I'm like, Germans are like, I don't want this film because it says Germans are cowards. Poland's like, I don't want this film because it's pro-Germany. Mm -hmm. It's it, well, it <laughs> it shows the characters in a in a very sympathetic type yeah. of tone, which I mean, I I get that's what they were they were probably going after. Yeah, no, definitely. It just I just thought it was that weird that like they both banned it for but for completely opposite reasons. Right. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um. And then also, I guess. Lou Ayers, who played Paul. Um, don't know if this is true, but from what I found here, it says part of uh, his experience playing that part, uh, he became a conscientious... I hate saying this word. Conscientious. Cons conscientious. It's a hard word to say. A, a conscientious objector during the Second World War uh, to not you know, have to go do any of that. So I just thought that was kind of interesting that mm -hmm. it impacted him so much. Um, but yeah, it was also... Uh, the second most popular movie at the box office for 1930. Um, so it's it's another one of those ones where the Oscar winner was also in the box office, mm -hmm. winnings top, you know, five. Um, but it wasn't like last time where it was also the winner. It was it was close, but it wasn't the winner. Um, so yeah, break into this movie. Um, it has an opening statement that I thought was interesting. Uh, so I literally wrote it down here verbatim. This story is neither an accusation nor a confession, and at least of all, an adventure. For death is not an adventure to those who stand face to face with it. It will try simply to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by the war. Mm -hmm. So this this was based off of a book by the same name, and the, the author mm -hmm. uh, escapes me at the moment. Um, but he based that story on his own experiences in really? in World War One, on for, fighting for the German army. Um, at, after the book was became incredibly popular, and then there was the resulting film and stuff. Um, he actually had to flee Germany um, really? due because of the the Nazi Party. Um, anybody that was deemed you know undesirable or not you know all in on the effort were removed and so he had to flee for mm. for that reason um yeah it's it's a really really good book 
I don't know if you've ever if you've ever read it. Um, no, I knew this was based on a book. Um, yeah, but that's as far as my knowledge of it went. Yeah, he, he like I said, he he had to flee like his home country because he he wasn't he wouldn't have survived if he stayed. Yeah, um, I believe the the title of the book was actually slightly different. It wasn't like all quiet on the Western Front. It was something along the lines of like. Uh, no news of the West or something something like that. I know it was slightly different mm-hmm. because I'd read that it had something to do with the fact that um, the radio in like Germany and the news in Germany would talk about like, oh, you know, on the Eastern Front, you know, we've made all these advances, all this stuff we did. And on the Western Front, no news, no change. Yeah, it's <clears throat> censorship in the news, news organizations during that time was very heavy. Yeah. Um, no bad news, no pictures, no videos. Couldn't talk about it. You know, everything's all hunky-dory. You know, it'll be over by Christmas, that type of nonsense. Um, and actually around the same time, um, the Spanish flu that was kind of ravaging around the time, um, the whole reason why it got the name the Spanish flu was because um, Spain didn't have the same censorship laws um, over their news media. And they were reporting on it, and then it just kind of stuck as the Spanish flu because they were the only ones talking about it yeah uh, even though it was potentially everywhere else just yeah, okay uh, it was everywhere uh, the, funnily enough it's it started uh, the popular theory is that it originated in kansas really um, at, at fort riley as a matter <laughs> of fact yeah <laughs> look kansas on the map <laughs> yeah because you, you'd have all of these soldiers there training yeah um someone gets sick spreads it to somebody else they ship them overseas to the front lines they mm-hmm. give it to everybody else they come back home and now it's everywhere hmm but yeah, they, they were following, they, they found some uh, patient reports of, of young soldiers who had passed away rather quickly with this mysterious illness at Fort Riley, and that's where they think it started. Oh, wow. That's a, a, a weird, interesting connection. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, but the, the, like I said, for, uh, it's got on that little tangent, but that's yeah. the censorship is, is what I was referring yeah. to. Um, well, hey, you mentioned young men, yes. so let's start with... The movie, uh, and I'm probably going to skip around a little bit because uh, I'll admit right up at the front that this um, film was a little difficult to to follow and care about for the first half or so, um, for me personally. Um, but so the film kind of opens um, at a school, right? Uh, and there's <laughs> like... It's, it's somewhere in Germany. I don't remember the exact town, uh, but it's somewhere in Germany. And they're all talking about, like, you know, you guys, like, you know, they're whatever, 16, 17, or whatever they're supposed to be. Like, you guys should go and, you know, enlist in the in the German army and go and help fight for the fatherland and all that good stuff. Um, and, of course, while he's doing that, my first thought is, like, these teenagers look like they're fucking over 30. Um, <laughs> as, as with all things, teenagers are played by mid-30s actors. <laughs> But um, it was definitely kind of the propaganda, which is what I'm going to kind of reference later on. The propaganda of, you know, like standing up, fighting for your country, fighting for what Germany believes in and going and, you know, helping your fellow German uh, by volunteering. And the reason I had a little problem following the verse because there's like six or seven dudes Mm -hmm. um, and you don't really get any of their names very easily. Uh, But to start with, like some of them were like stand up, like I'll fight for Germany and I'll fight for Germany, and I was like, uh, I, don't, I don't know. And they're like, Come on, man, you gotta fight for Germany. Uh, and then he joined in too, so it was like all these friends that went and like enlisted together. That's that was actually relatively common, and yeah. for for World War One, especially. I mean, it happened in Germany and um, England, uh, France, the the United States when they were involved. Um, schools were uh, like teachers would, would give the whole, you know, rabble rousing national pride kind of thing. And people would enlist in droves. Um, if you didn't enlist, then typically you were conscript, uh, conscripted, uh, if you were in that, in that age range. So that's not unheard of. Yeah. Teachers would give the, the big rabble rouse and then people would go enlist in mass. Yeah. I just, I, I, it seemed so weird. Cause I mean, obviously this is, you know, what, 99 years ago for the movie, um, but obviously, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, over a century for, you know, when this is supposedly taking place. Mm-hmm. Um, so it just seems so 
radically different because that's not something I'm used to when I went to high school. Um, but it did make me wonder. So part of while they're all trying to go enlist, uh, this mailman goes by, which is actually a uh, Himmel Stoss. Mm-hmm. Right, he's the mailman, and they're like, you know, hey, you got any mail for us? And you're traveling light today or whatever. Uh, and he's all like, oh, well, tomorrow I go, you know, back into the the thick of it, because I, I guess he was also a... Uh, was a reservist. Yeah, exactly. So he was being called back. And what I found interesting is, like, so the boys that all enlisted, <laughs> the boys that all enlisted, uh, they get sent off to boot camp, right? And the person they end up you know, reporting to is this Himmelstoss guy who is the mailman. And at, four, at first they don't take him seriously. And they're all like, hey, man, how's it going? And he's like, you know, shut up, get in line. Oh, come on, man. Mm-hmm. And all this kind of stuff. And so it made me wonder, and you being more of the history buff uh, might know this, is like, was familiarity with people from your town like an issue with rank of the military? I, I don't know specifically, but I could see that being an issue, especially for new recruits. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, hey, let's go sign up. Well, now you're, you know, private first class or whatever, whatever the entry level is. And then, you know, your friendly mailman or the neighbor you were friends with or family friend or what have you had a rank that's higher than you. Once you're in, then, yeah, I could see that being tough to differentiate between the civilian person that you know, and now all of a sudden they're your superior officer and there are standards and expectations for how you act. Um, Honestly, with what they were doing, if it was, if they wanted to push the issue, I I could see them absolutely throwing them all in the brig for, (laughs) you know, in subordination. Especially for what comes in a little bit. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it just struck me. I was like, I could see that being a thing because like to what you said earlier, like I'm used to nowadays where like you go enlist and you get shipped off wherever you get shipped off. But you had mentioned how like during, you know, World War One and like some earlier stuff like that, you know, people who enlisted from the same town mm-hmm. like served together. Yeah, to, the same same companies. Yeah, so I could see that. I was like, yeah, that familiarity of somebody you know from home, that relationship changes when suddenly you know they're your superior officer, um, and that being a kind of a, a culture shock potentially. Yeah, I I, I absolutely could see that happening because yeah. like, hey, I know him, you know, because you're in this you know strange new environment and you you look for things that are familiar hey, that's my neighbor, or that's the mailman, or what have you, and you try to latch on to that, and all of a sudden it's, you know, you can't do that anymore. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they get into boot camp, uh, and <laughs> I, I'm guessing this was something that was done on purpose, because at first I was like, eh. Um, I see them, you know, marching, and I'm like, man, none of them are like, their feet aren't together, like, they're not marching properly at all. Uh, and then it kind of shows them continue to train a little bit and then it shows them marching by again and suddenly they're in step and I'm like, oh, it's, it's, that it's, must have been on purpose to yeah, show that they were was, learning. It's just to show like this was day one and they're terrible at this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, but it threw me off first. I was like, like that's smart. Like, you guys look like crap. Oh, yeah, this this was day learning. one. This was first day. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but Himmelstoss is really riding them hard to try to make them, you know, as great as they can be and like show off for his superiors like look at my you know troop over here and how good they're doing uh and so they they decide to while they got had they kept having to like crawl through the mud every time they walked marched by it uh and then they had to go and like clean themselves up uh, and then himself like went out on the town essentially Mm -hmm. and then on his way back they apparently they waited for him in the woods holding a giant white bed sheet from a tree (laughs) and then jump down on him, tie him up, yank his pants down and like toss him in the mud. I don't care how dark it is or how drunk you were. You would see a giant white bed sheet hanging from the tree. You, you would think so. It wasn't Um, even bundled up. It was spread out. Yeah. yeah. The, the whole, I, I mean, I get the, um, I get what they were trying to go for in that particular scene, you know, bonding with, you know, with your, your squad mates and, you know, universal hatred of your, your CO or what have you. Um, Dark bed sheet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I like, I mean, I, the, that scene was a little over the top for me for, for that reason. Like, yeah. I don't care how drunk you are. You're going to see, see that type of stuff. But I mean, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it just, it really stuck out to me for some stupid reason. But um, anyways, so it got a little blurry for me after that because I admit this was a little difficult for me to watch just because it was, it, 
it didn't have as much of a story early on really um and going forward i still don't think it has a much of a story but i'll get to why i say that um eventually you know they graduate from boot camp right and then they get sent off to the, the you know the front lines of wherever they're stationed mm-hmm. and feel free to stop me if i've missed anything important <laughs> I, that's that's pre- i mean they go through boot camp and then they they graduate and yeah then they're they're shipped off so, so yeah. you don't you don't miss you, you didn't miss much while you were zoning out <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i was watching the movie but i'm just like uh <laughs> um but so like they get sent out and like where they end up getting stationed like they all of them are guys like they're sending out a guy to go like hunt for food um and i'm curious again the history guy here um was that a thing where yes. like everyone was like starving because they yes. weren't getting sent food yes for everybody or specifically just germany or what no, everybody on the front lines their right. supplies were incredibly scarce um mm-hmm. and this was both for the allies and the axis so germany um you know all of it, it was it was rough for everyone um there was no food there was hardly any water um it, it that was one of the things that I thought um, re- kind of was was shown pretty well. Um, they had one scene where they were um, in one of the trenches, um, like in their little hidey hole. And then all of a sudden, like this army of rats mm-hmm. would like rush out. Um, and they started, you know, killing them with shovels. It wouldn't have been unheard of for them to, that's dinner now. I was wondering if that was going to happen because after they did all the boom, 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 and I guess like the rats were done attacking, yeah, <laughs> they just laid down and relaxed again. That, like, that, that's what I thought they were going to do is like start like all right, we're here at dinner. Yeah, it's it's not unheard of for like well that's that's dinner now. Mm-hmm. So get a fire going. That's that's what we're going to cook. Um, yeah, there was no no supplies, no food, no nothing. Um, and actually, in that that same scene where like the shells that were you know keeping them awake for days and days on yep perfect that that was incredibly accurate well i'm gonna have a question about that in a second uh, oh, sorry well. i got, got a little no no no, no you're absolutely fine um so did bombs really whistle when they were coming down from the yes, sky some of them did. They did it was it was part of a um Cause I, I mean my military knowledge history knowledge is way over there yes yeah, so uh, i never was... picked it up and put it in my brain um so some of them did it was it was like a psychological effect um and um, continuing with that, like French had shells that would do that. Germany had shells that would do that. It was just to inspire terror because mm-hmm. you hear that whistling and you don't know where that shell's going to go. You can't sleep through it. You can't do anything about it. You just have to hope that you survive. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, so when they got to the, back to the whole like yeah, starving sorry. thing, <laughs> the guy went and stole a pig off of a train to bring back to you know cook for everybody and the new troops that just got there and i'm curious did it ever say who they stole the pig from or is there just a random train carrying food that none of the military that's like right down the street gets to eat it uh, they didn't say specifically who it was for but it wouldn't surprise me if that was meant for the officers so they, we made sure the officers ate, but the dudes out there dying. Exactly. You're going to die anyway. You don't need food. Exactly. Yeah, same thing. That's fucked up. Um, <laughs> that, that's Again, I'm guessing, but it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, no, I, I know you're not saying that's exactly what happened, but that's... Mm. Um, so, actually, I meant to mention this earlier, too. So, I'm used to hearing, like, the motherland, right? But then when I hear stuff about, like, Germany, I hear fatherland. And so I specifically went and looked something up about this because I was curious, like, why do some say fatherland? Why do some say motherland? And from what I found, um, the male image of a country calls for patriotism and loyalty, and the female metaphor uh, is about a sense of belonging and love. And apparently motherland is widely used in languages with Latin roots, so English, French, Spanish, etc. Uh, and then fatherland exists in Germanic and Slavic languages. So mm-hmm. you got obviously German, Swedish, Polish, R- Czech, stuff like that. Um, and I guess in German, uh, Vaterland refers to one's nationality, whereas Mutterland, when in use, indicates an object's origin, so where the food or music or sport comes from. And I, I like, did not oh. know that. That's interesting. I didn't either. I had to look it up. <laughs> but it just always threw me that, like, we talk about... I always hear the motherland, but obviously I hear that because I speak English. Right. Um, and then I hear fatherland from Germany. So it just, it always kind of I, kn- I knew me. there was a difference. I didn't know what it was. That's interesting. I, yeah. I, I learned something today. <laughs> I'm happy I could help. 
the more you know. <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> Which is funny. I wonder how many people that are, you know, say less than 30 actually know what the hell that is. <laughs> um, so, you mentioned all the shelling and everything like that. Uh, and the starving and whatnot. And this mm-hmm. is where, once we kind of got there, something started to click for me. In the sense of like, I kept feeling like there was no real story here. There's no story. And then it's like, it's not about the story. It's about the psychological effects of war and how it like the emotional reaction Mm -hmm. of people to dealing with all this. And I was like, I get it now. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of at the point I was like, I started paying a little more attention. Um, clicked for you yeah well because like i mean as we've said before like to me it's about story i want to know the story i want to know this character why what you know motivates them why should i care about Mm -hmm. them um and for the first you know half ish of this movie none of that was there and that's why i was kind of like i don't don't know why the hell anyone would give a shit about this movie right and then i'm like oh now i get it Mm -hmm. i mean i'm a century displaced from this war Whereas people who'd have been seeing this film, like, lived it, it through was, it. It was 12 years earlier. Yeah, yeah, they lived <laughs> through it, whether actually serving or back at home and knowing people that served and whatnot. So I'm like, I, I get it now. Um, yeah. Uh, and I, I really was able to see that in, like, some of the battle scenes. Because mm-hmm. there was no real structure per se it was very chaotic that's exactly which, how they were <laughs> yeah i know which i'm like that was pr- i now once i clicked with me i was like that's probably intentional to show just like it's it's mass chaos out there mm-hmm. and we're all just trying to live through it and i'm seeing like you know people charging uh, a bunker uh to attack but while they're charging and getting up to the bunker to attack the people still back at their line are still firing over here. So now they're getting hit by their friendly fire as yep. well as the fire of the people they're trying to take down. So I was just like, the, the the chaos, I think, played into just like how you just would lose your fucking mind having to deal yeah, with this shit. Yeah, it's with like um, going back to the bunker scene, like the, the artillery shells would not stop mm-hmm. um, for days and days and days. Um, yeah, they can provide enough shelling, enough like artillery to fire, you know, what, 15, 20 of those every 60 seconds. It, it, but it, they couldn't give them a ham. I mean... <laughs> yeah, it's... It, it, so, back in, like, for uh, they, uh, for the for the artillery shelling specifically, um, they used to practice something called drum fire. And for, like, if you're, if you're trying to loosen up, you know, a, a, a trench line or something like that that you're going to assault, like, the day after or a couple of days later on, mm-hmm. you would... Th- throw you know 30 60 shells every like 10 seconds i mean it's for you know several days and there's pop marks and shit blowing up all over the place and then you would charge and the shells that you couldn't really accurately aim did nothing but blow up everything else around these poor people they would mow you down you would retreat they would charge then they would get killed and then you would charge again you you would fight and lose however many thousands of soldiers for yards at a time, and that went on for years. Yeah, it was a monstrous loss of life. I, it's shaking. Like I, ugh. yeah, it's it's it was tough. I mean, just watching those chaotic scenes, it like I knew this was probably one of the more like I haven't seen the newer version of this, but for 1930, that would have been. I mean, like, for, for our time, when, like, Saving Private Ryan came out, you still had paratroopers and soldiers that participated in the Normandy landing that had those memories, like, sparked up, and they started getting, you know, they would have to leave the theater just because it brought everything back. Yeah. Same type of situation with this. I mean, it was incredibly chaotic. Nobody knew what was happening. Nobody, it was nuts. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine having to have dealt with any of that i i um, certainly couldn't i i yeah. i'll straight up tell you there's no way i'd be able to to deal with anything even remotely close to that yeah i i, I miss a few hours of sleep in one night and i become an asshole and i'm very fucking cranky upset and just like all out you keep me up for three nights straight yeah um well speaking of um like just them dealing with 
what's happening to them. I thought this was very interesting. Uh, at one point when they're, I don't think they're in the bunk at the time. They were like kind of away and having a, a bit of a break. But the soldiers were discussing like, you know, who started this war and why? Like, why the hell are we here doing this? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the point? Um, and that part kind of hit me because I'm like, it's very true. Like, you know, you have, I mean, even today, uh, you'll have, I don't like this person at this country. Well, I don't like this person at this country. So we're going to go to war. And the people that made the decision, just sit back at, you know, at home, you know, comfy and sending all these men to die because of their problem with each other. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if y'all don't like each other, get in a fucking ring and figure it out yourselves. Why are you sending thousands or even potentially hundreds of thousands, millions of people to die because of your beef? It, so with World War One, it was... Um, it I was, know it's more complicated than what I'm saying. Oh, these yeah, two guys hating yeah. each other. But I'm just like, that's kind of... I'm just pointing out the fact that like the people who are deciding to do this fight aren't the ones fighting. Yeah, there there was there was actually a scene towards um uh, I won't get too involved cuz we'll we'll get to it, but they they touch <laughs> on that. <laughs> so, yeah, I just I, I thought it was interesting that they the soldiers on the front line were actually talking about that. And I was like, I could see that being a real thing. That's that's a very popular um concept among soldiers on the front line. Like, what are we even doing here? This yeah. is stupid. <laughs> yeah, and so at this point, um, you know, they've been dealing with war, you know, they've, they've seen death right in front of them. Uh, and one of the like six guys, uh, or whoever many there were, uh, dies. Uh, he's in a, like, it's not really a hospital, it's a makeshift kind of thing. Um, and one of them dies and I thought this was crazy and I don't know if it's just, you know, me being, you know, I'm sitting on my couch and just viewing this from afar versus what it may have actually been like to be there. But the guy didn't even react to his friend dying. He just wanted his boots. Yeah. You, when, um, it's, again, it's, it's not unheard of for people in those types of high stress situations that you don't become too attached to someone that's next to you because they could be gone in 10 seconds. Yeah. Well, um, these are like, these are the guys that grew up together. Right. So, yeah. But that's, that's that whole coping thing. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, I mean, they'd snapped why i mean i don't i mean he's he's got nice boots i could yeah. use those he's he obviously doesn't need them they he even made that same comment so i mean you could see how he would make that connection like yeah i'm still here i need these he's not yeah and, and that's what i was saying like it was i i didn't put that down as an issue like you know why the hell he didn't do this because I, I even had that in my head i was like normally you're going to react to a friend dying but this is not a normal situation yeah You've been obviously dealing with all the craziness that happens when you're in this, you know, massive war and just watching people die all around you. And it just, it stuck out that that happened, but it also made me think, it was like, that's probably kind of what really did happen. Yeah. Because people it's, are dying around you constantly. You can't sit there and mourn every single fucking one of them. Yeah. It's it's that whole dehumanization of yeah. both. I mean, yeah, you, you got your comrades with you, but if, you know, if they're killed, well, I'm still here. I still have a job to do. Yeah. And you can't, like you said, you can't spend 10, 15 seconds mourning your friend that was just there is no longer there. You still have all of these people trying to kill you now. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I like what they did with the boots after that though. Oh, the, 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 the um, montage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little death montage, but yeah. <laughs> so essentially, you know, somebody else took those boots, right? And like, I'm going to wear these boots and it shows them, it kind of has like a zoom in of the boots and zooms out in the person having the boots and then they died. Mm -hmm. And then another one of the group, okay, well, he's dead. I'm going to take the boots. And then he's like marching along with the boots and then it shows him and he dies. And and it pretty much whoever wears these fucking boots is the next one to die. And it just starts going through them. And they use that as like a little montage to show the rest of the group all die until like the only guy left is Paul. Mm -hmm. And I remember Paul's name because once... All of them were gone. There was one guy left. It was easy to remember a fucking name. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Paul's like the last one left. Uh, and while there's a, a lot of like another one of like, you know, just massive bombs and bullets flying, he falls into a ditch with another guy, which uh, was he French? He was um, French. Yeah, French. Um, and they both like spring at each other right and you know paul stabs him and kills him 
Uh, and then he's just going nuts in this ditch with this dead French guy that he's talking to. Like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, I, we could be friends. And I was like, you could just see more of that psychological effect if he's fucking losing it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did break a little bit during that because the guy's dead, but he's still just like this. And I'm like, how's he sitting up and how's his head up if he's fucking dead? Shouldn't he have fallen back? It's not, depending on, like, how he was sitting. Or at sitting. least his head? Like, well, it, again, depending on, like, how his, if he was rested up against something. Um, there was nothing supporting the, actually, his head. Actually, no, that's a bit of a goof, actually. Because they showed him laying down on one shot. And then on the next one, he's, he's sitting, sitting up, up and yeah. staring ahead. And then the next one, he's leaning back again. Oh, okay, I didn't catch him leaning back again. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I did notice the laying down and then sitting up. But I was like looking behind his head, like there's nothing supporting his head, so his head should at least be like this. Yeah, it, it, that's that's a bit of. But a that, that, that broke me a little bit in that scene. But yeah, yeah. no, I, I I liked the scene. Um, continuity could have been a little better, um, just for for that reason. But I I liked, like you said, it's showing he's he's breaking and this ain't good. <laughs> yeah, and then um, they they actually you skipped a little bit. There was that scene uh, in when he was in the hospital, um, because they they had. Uh, because he, he had that uh, shrapnel wound, um, and they sent him to the hospital. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he had his one of his friends there, um, and then he was there. That was after then, the boots, but before the... Yeah, this was this was after the boots, but before the, um, the, ditch, okay, the yeah. crater scene, where he was in the hospital. And, I guess it was a little bit bigger than a ditch, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, they, they showed him, like, you know, he was getting his wounds dressed, and then there was that, that dude that... Um, they they said he was uh, he took a like a hit in the head or something. They they gave him a you know a piece of paper that says he's sometimes not responsible for his actions. So he took full advantage of mm-hmm. it. <laughs> um, but no, he he told him that you know anytime they take you to the dressing the 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 bandage station, um, nobody ever comes back from there. Well, they say if if, if they're taking you and they grab your stuff, yeah, if they, they take they, your they have stuff. No too, intention you of bringing you back. back. Yeah. Um, I could see that. I mean, people show up at this field hospital. I mean, yeah, if, if they take you away to, I mean, it's, it's a morale thing. They're not going to be like, yeah, this guy's dead. I'm taking him away. Oh, this guy's dead. I'm taking him away. Mm. We're, we're just going to go change his bandages. Yeah. Um, but they showed him freaking out. Like, I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I'm staying right yeah, here. Yeah, <laughs> they, they came and started wheeling him away. Yeah. And he kind of starts looking back. And they see the the nurse or doctor whoever come and like grab his stuff and go with him. That's when he's just like, "Whoa, no, no, no!" Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was an I I, I like that scene. Um, but yeah, that was that was before that because he, um, because the crater was right after that, if I recall. Or wait, no, no, I had it backwards. Or was it after because like, I had it backwards in the crater? So yeah, I had it backwards because um because That's of that he kept seeing. Yeah, um, no, he had the um, so there was the uh, crater. And then, then he took the shell and went to the hospital after um, spending the night with those three French women, with his buddies. Is that right? Well, I thought his buddies were all dead by then. Who who cares? It's... But not 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 his classmates. His his other. Oh, people. okay, okay. Yeah, I, it, it was a long movie, and like there was no <laughs> I'm real structure. It was just up, like yeah. shit to you know. I I may have mixed stuff up. I should write this shit down. <laughs> <laughs> he, he comes prepared. I'm just, I'm just winging it. Well, you have a better memory than I do too. I, apparently not. <laughs> I'm just mixing up. You know, hey, we're gonna go scene three, seven, four, two. <laughs> hey, that makes a great film. Um, this isn't Memento. This yeah. is. But when he was, maybe, this isn't Memento. Uh, when he was bring uh, brought back, like he's like, guys, I'm back, I'm back. Right, like yeah. they didn't, you know, he didn't die. Like they redressed his bandage and brought him back. But yeah. Um, I think it was not too long after that, though, is when uh, they were, like, back in a bar and lusting after a poster that had a girl on it and started talking to the poster and, like, hey, baby, you want to come out with me? That kind of stuff. Right. I mean, obviously with 19, you know, 15 or whatever talk. Yeah. Um, but then they started getting mad because the poster also had a guy in it that was looking at the girl. Because it was like like a movie poster or something. I don't know. And they're just like, what? He's going to take her away from us. You know, he can't have her. He's uh, She's ours. And so they go and they like, grab the poster and they rip it. And it rips perfectly in half just taking the guy off and leaving the lady. It's, a, it's that movie magic. It's that yeah, movie just, magic. I wanted to comment on that because I was like, what the heck? Um... Oh, yeah, and I don't remember what scene this took place in, 
but I remembered somebody saying this and it threw me like, what the hell? Uh, I think it actually might have been during the whole, when they're in France or something like that. But somebody commented and was amazed that the people that lived here, he heard bathed every week yep. and thought that was crazy. They bathed every week. And I'm just like, man, living a century ago, I'm like, once a week? Ugh. But I, but I get like, this is a hundred years later where I have right. a freaking shower. They, uh, they, they, like, like you said, it's once a week and these guys were just gotten off rotation. So they were on the front lines for who knows how long. Well, I get them not being yeah. able to clean, but to me, I'm like, you wouldn't be amazed at the idea of bathing every week just because you haven't been able to, cause you're at war. You get that. To me, I'm like, if you're amazed at somebody bathing every week, that means even in normal times, you don't bathe once a week. You bathe less than that. Yeah. And I'm just like, times were different. <laughs> you, you, you had to go down to the watering hole and bring back buckets of water that you would drink, cook with, all this yeah. other stuff. And you're like, well, I'm not going to make a special trip just for a bath. <laughs> yeah. And like, like I said, I, I get it. I, I get it. It was a different time. They didn't necessarily have like all the modern plumbing in every single building and everything like that. Right. So I'm definitely, and, and if I lived through that, it'd be the norm. I wouldn't think anything of it. But it's just looking back, I'm just like, Mm, they they have did have stinky. yeah they so i mean keep them where they were from what small village in the middle of nowhere germany I'm, yeah. I'm assuming they did have running water in some parts in some cities in the u.s um but i don't know how prevalent it would have been or popular it would have been in yeah. rural germany yeah very true speaking of the french women um they were, you know, stationed wherever they're stationed, and they're like hollering at those girls, they're like, you know, hey, baby, 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 you know, um, and they're just like, oh, you know, and ignoring them. And then one of the guys runs and gets like a loaf of bread mm -hmm. and starts swimming. I'm like, look, I got bread. And suddenly it's just like they just got moist because the guys are just so attractive. And so I'm just like, <laughs> were, were they starving? Because they, yes, they're, I mean, I'm guessing they must have because like suddenly they want to fool around and have sex with these guys to get some bread. It, it's and I'm the like, same. That's, that's crazy. Like, like I said, in the same situation for Germany. As, also, as a century well. later, and I'm like looking back at this stuff. Yeah, it's it. Everything went towards the war effort. Yeah. So, like, you had rationing. You had hardly any sort of food. Uh, it it affected everybody. So I absolutely could see like, he's got bread. I will do what I need to do to get that. Yeah. It just it. It threw me for a loop that I'm like. I've never been so hungry that I would do something like that, but I'm very beneficial to be where I am because there's people today that still are starving. Yeah, I'm 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 very very um, fortunate. Yes, that, as, that as we don't a, have we don't have those we concerns. Yeah. yeah, like we don't have to deal with that. We're I mean, <laughs> I'm obviously eating in excess <laughs> and need to stop. Um, so it's just it was it it just struck me. It yeah. stuck out to me that like. You're so starving that you're like, I will do anything for a loaf of bread. Yeah. Um, just something I've never had to deal with, um, fortunately. You know? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I've, I've been very fortunate yeah. um, for, for that. Uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful that yeah. I, I, don't have to, did, I don't have to worry about that. Yeah, I mean, seeing like stuff like this makes you realize that like the, 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 the term first world problems is, it's a thing. Uh, is a thing. Yeah. I'm like... Some of the things that I'll be bitching about, I have no room to bitch at yeah. all. I have a house. I have running water where I can bathe more than once a week. Yeah. I have food on my table. Like, I've got no room to bitch about anything when there's other people dealing with much, much worse conditions. Right. So it, it definitely kind of gives a level set. Yeah, it, 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 was a, it showed, at, 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 as going back to the movie that what these guys were dealing with it wasn't that i mean they they were dealing with you know lack of everything even mm -hmm. in france the people they were fighting yeah so it, it was affecting everybody whether they knew, you know realized it or not yeah no definitely um while they were in the french ladies houses um supposedly you know fooling around uh this was a, a nitpick i had uh, it's something I've seen in a couple movies we've watched so far, and it really annoys the hell out of me. You have a full dialogue conversation between a couple of people for, you know, 30, 40 seconds, maybe a full minute. And all we're doing is staring at a wall or a table, and the people who are talking are not there. Oh, that scene, yeah. Yeah, so that bothered me so much. And I'm that, just like, <laughs> that's if it's not, not worth showing them, 
cut the fucking scene. <laughs> they they were trying to show that he was trying to um, communicate with this woman because, um, you know, for purposes of the story, she spoke French, he spoke German. They kind of figured out how to ask each other's I names. I German because I watched this whole movie. No, sorry. <laughs> they were German. Yeah, Let's I assume I they were know. speaking German. <laughs> Um, but for the, the sake of the story, like they, he was, um, he slept with her, you know, they shared food, um, and he was trying to talk with her. Um, but they obviously weren't, I mean, they were in bed, I'm assuming without clothing. This was 1930. They're not going to show two oh, I naked know they're people. not going to show that, but um, to me, I'm like, if the dialogue is important enough to keep it in the film, don't have them in bed during the time of this conversation, have them off out of bed clothed again. It, it was, it was there. It was this, it was pillow talk. Because he's like, I just slept with this woman. I'm going to try and talk with her and, and at least share some of my feelings. Because he, he made there was a line in there. He's like, I just want you to know I'm never going to see you again. She obviously didn't understand it. Yeah. But he was trying to you know, share these feelings that like, I could be dead tomorrow. I'm, this, we're, I'm never going to see you again. Yeah. So I, I get what they were trying to do with that particular scene. I, I, see, I see your... Um, like I, said, I did call it a nitpick. <laughs> yeah, I, I see where you're coming from with that, but I also see why it was important to, the, to, the to dialogue, keep in the movie. Yes. Yeah, the dialogue, yes, but I'm just saying, like, do the dialogue in a scene where I can see people. Right. I, I, I don't like staring at a wall. <laughs> but it was a nice wall. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, and then here's the part that we get to that suck out the most to me, and we're, we're getting back to what I said I was going to mention later. Uh, Paul gets to come back home um, after he's gone through all this shit. Um, after he's been like, you know, been healing and everything. Like yeah, they that. gave him leave. Uh, they gave him leave, and he came back home to his like hometown. And he's sitting in a bar with some older gentlemen, a few guys. I don't know who the hell they were supposed to be, but they were talking. Uh, they were asking him about the you know front line. How's the war effort going? You guys are kicking ass, right? And you know, Paul's just kind of being quiet because. What he lived, what the truth was, was not the propaganda right. that was being spit back uh, home. And, you know, it. one of those guys, like, when Paul started to say something, like, that's not how it really is. He's like, oh, shut up. You guys at the front lines are eating way better than we are here. Yeah. And how uh, how they're, like, in this cushy life at the front line where they're, like, back home starving, essentially. And I'm just, I was like, hmm, like it's that that that's kind of what i was referring to like because he was one of those old people that were kind of making decisions and and stuff like that Mm -hmm. and he had no idea what it was that he was part of asking these people to go through this absolute horror um he's like yeah you he had to happen to have this map and like here's the front line if you make it to here you you know the war will be done like we haven't even made it six yards and it's been five years yeah (laughs) And then they expanded upon that again, too, because he, I don't remember why or how he got there, but he got back to the schoolroom again. And that same professor is now with another group of kids, and this time they're actually kids, not, you know, 30 well, he, he year old men. He was doing that, that same he, rabble-rousing yeah, speech. Like, go join the war effort, you know. Uh, and there he's like, oh, Paul, come come tell them how, how great it is to fight for the fatherland. And he's like, no, no, you don't want to hear from me. He's like, no, no, just, just tell them that you, you don't want to hear what I have to say about this. Come on, come on, come on. And so he finally opened his mouth, which is essentially saying, like, it's it's not, like, what you think it's going to be. It's hard. It 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 hurts, you know, you, you're, you're going to lose people. You're going to see nothing but death. Mm-hmm. You're going to just be in a constant state of depression about what you're seeing happen around you. And they, you, know, you coward, you, everything like that. Yeah, that's, that's not on, I mean, that sort of situation happens with any conflict. Yeah. And it's, it was very prevalent here in the United States um, after Vietnam. Like, you would have soldiers come back and they would denounce the war. Like, what are we doing here? This is stupid. And, you know, they were attacked for not being patriotic enough or being cowards. Yeah. And the, it's the same same bullshit, you know, different day. It's I, I, I absolutely would see that because it happens every single time. Yeah. And it just, for me, it further drove in, like, the truth of, you know, the the reality of war versus the propaganda that's yep. for, shown for to the perceived back home. version yeah. yeah um so it goes back to like there's not 
like there, there's a, there was more of a story with Paul at that point because uh, like he lived through this stuff and people are telling him that what he experienced is not what really is happening right um, and so he's just like I, I can't whatever deal with I'm this. done I'm going back and so he called off his leave early went back to the front lines and then while in one of the trenches sees a butterfly land and decides to kind of reach out and try to catch this butterfly you know something you know beautiful in all of this shit around him and as he's reaching out to catch the butterfly he gets popped by a sniper and that's the end of his story dead done um thoughts <laughs> to, uh, so it's it's the first time that i had seen this this version of of this movie i'd seen the 60s one um i i um, How's the sixties one compare? Is it the same kind of thing? It's it's rough. It's this it's roughly the same story. Um but like this one, um I still need to see the new one. Um and we'll we'll either we'll get to it as the course of this podcast because it did win an Oscar for Best Foreign Picture. Um so we'll get to it maybe eventually <laughs> down the line, or I'll see it before. If, if we start doing foreign picture yeah. Offers, yeah. Um to be honest, like aside from the the very um dark, I don't want to say dark, but very important material that this movie went over. I absolutely loved it. Um, I didn't have the, the same, um, issue with like the first half of the movie. Cause like, to be honest, when I was sitting down to watch it, um, just that impassioned speech that the professor was giving these kids, like that grabbed my attention. Cause I mean, like, cause I knew what the story was about and then they, they showed that captivating, you know, rabble rousing speech that he gave. And like you, you know, you're right along with them. Like mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm, I'm in this story. I absolutely love the movie. Um, for 1930 with, with the, the battle scenes and the chaoticness or the nature of those that was illustrated perfectly. Um, a lot of the special effects that they did for this, I mean, were, you know, uh, top of the line or cutting edge stuff for 1930. Mm-hmm. Like there was, um, there were some real quick cuts where during the first battle scene, when they showed the uh, French was attacking after one of those artillery barrages and they showed two of these guys jump down in a crater. And then like a split second later, there was this puff of smoke and sparks and then they're just gone. I, I mean, again, it really illustrated the, the horrors of what these people went through. I absolutely, yeah. I absolutely love the movie. Yeah. Um, I can't say I loved the movie, just because, like I said, for me, it's all about story. But I didn't dislike the movie. Because, like I said, for the first part, it's like, I don't understand why I'm supposed to care. And it, I, I think it was right around the boots scene mm-hmm. with the whole montage of people dying where stuff started clicking for me. And it's like the second half following Paul's journey and like just him slowly losing his mind mm-hmm. uh, dealing with everything around him. To me, I'm like, that was the story. Um, so I would have been able to pick up with it faster if it had focused more on Paul in the beginning mm-hmm. and not on all these guys. And they are all just kind of like intermixable at that point. It's, it shows, so it's one of the more prevalent, like anti-war movies, mm-hmm. um, from, from the book to, you know, all the iterations of it. Um, what they, they, it was one of the first films, at least that I'm aware of where it showed, the psychological effects of yeah. what this was on, on this type of scale. Um, because like we, we had reviewed, um, wings, yeah. uh, several episodes back. Um, and they showed, you know, the, the flying scenes and stuff like that, but they didn't really get into the, I mean, I hate to use this, this, this term, but in the trenches as it were for, which is, it's a little too on the nose, but you get my point. Yeah. Um, where it showed like, just the absolute horror of what these guys were dealing with on this grand scale. Um, that's, that's what, that's what I really liked about this was it was one of the first like American produced war epics of, of this sky of this size and scale. Yeah, no, I will hold that it's, it's an important film and it has an important message mm-hmm. uh, in what it's kind of trying to deliver is like, don't just believe everything's throwing on the news because it's not necessarily what's really happening and you know what these you know men and you know any women who might have served as well went through 
is just ridiculous. And the idea of trying to learn from our past versus, you know, letting this happen again, which we obviously did let it happen again, you know, like 20 years later, um, or 30 years or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, but maybe using all of that to keep it in perspective to avoid this down the road, I guess. Well, it's, I it's, just... it's, it's that old adage. Those, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so yeah, like I said, I didn't love the movie. Um, I did have some issues with it, but once it got, you know, far enough into the film that it clicked to me that it's, it's not about story. It's about what they're dealing with. Yes, exactly. Once that clicked with me, I started enjoying it a lot more. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, will I ever watch it again? Probably not, but I think the idea of the film will probably stick with me. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a very, very important movie. Um, because again, this was, um, again, it's the first one that I know of that, that showed what these poor people went through. Mm -hmm. Um, that's not something that people like to talk about and they don't to this day, what soldiers have to deal with when they're coming home. Or what they're dealing with, like on on the battlefield, or or after or after they come back, it's just something that nobody likes to talk about. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, cool. Any closing thoughts about that one before we jump into something else? I, I like I said, I I love the movie. Um, it, it is one of those things that'll stick with you. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to go back through and watch because it's been a really long time since I've seen the '60s version, um, and I really want to see the the. The most recent one. The recent one, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to kind of compare and, and contrast. Yeah. But it's... it. I well, really maybe that's a, it. another one. We, we, we've already watched this one, then we both watched the 60s, and we watched the current one, and just... Talk, I don't know. Yeah. We'll see. Um, all right, so what do you want to do next? We can do either the big house or the divorcee. I'm fine with whatever. Either one. Come on, man, pick. Let's do the divorcee. Okie dokie. All right. So the divorcee. Directed by Robert Z. Leonard. The Z is important. It's very important. Um, I couldn't find the production budget on this, but it's uh, it's not that big of a deal because this is another one of the best film nominees um, that did not win. Stars Norma Shearer, Shearer. As, as Jerry, uh, Chester Morris as Ted, Robert Montgomery as Don, and Conrad Nagel, Nagel, I don't know, as, mm, excuse me, Paul. Um and the synopsis is a, when a woman discovers that her husband has been unfaithful to her, she decides to respond to his infidelities in kind. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Hence the plot. <laughs> um, and shit happens. End of movie. Thanks. So, Goodbye. Uh, I want to comment on something before we jump into this film. Um, I say we could pick between the divorcee and the big house. Well, it wouldn't matter which one we pick because it has the same fucking actors in it. Yes. Robert Montgomery. Yes. <laughs> who plays Don and Chester Morris. Who is also who in the big Ted, house. Are also in the big house. Yep. Um, I'm which noticing is another that one a of the lot. Films, they're another one of the year's best film nominees. So they were in two of the films that were nominated for best film. Which I actually found out later on uh, when I was doing some research that apparently the early Oscars... You'd have the same person nominated for several things, mm-hmm. uh, not not different awards, but like this person is nominated as best like actor for these three films, so they have three entries. Yeah, uh, and they eventually are like, no, actors get one entry per. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, Chester Chester Morris, um, aside from being in the Big House, which was in this, he was also in the Alibi, which yep. we watched the last last time around. Yeah, um, and uh, I'd mentioned uh, Rob from. All Quiet on the Western Front. It, it wasn't um, Alibi that he was in. He was in the Racket. That's that's what the film was. He was in the Racket. He played the Scar- the older Scarcy brother. Okay. The the old guy that came into the police station or what have you. If you guys want context, watch watch the older episode. Yeah, no, I remember what you're talking about. But he he, he was the like. old mob boss that. Yeah, the, yeah, I remember, the guy was I remember trying who to get. Was. I just don't remember what he looks like. Yeah, it, it's it's all comes around because everybody's in all of these same movies. Because there was like twelve actors. Yeah, apparently then. Hollywood had twelve <laughs> people in it. Um, so something else I wanted to mention, which I thought was quite interesting, Norma Shearer, who plays Jerry. Um, apparently, the 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 role of Jerry was originally being sought after, and was uh, the producers originally wanted. Joan Crawford. 
Okay. Um, but both Norma and Joan wanted this Jerry role. Uh, and, but obviously Norma eventually got it. And Joan Crawford uh, was in an interview uh, and brought up this role. And she was like, well, what do you expect? She sleeps with the boss. And I was like, huh? So I started digging a little further. Uh, and she's referring to Norma's husband, MGM production chief Irving Thalberg. And apparently, prior to this film being a thing, even her husband wanted Joan Crawford to play it, right? To play mm. Jerry. Uh, and Norma had primarily played uh, very, like, proper ladylike roles. Mm -hmm. And she wanted something with a, a little more substance. You know, she wanted to kind of change her image. Uh, so she started campaigning for this role of Jerry. <laughs> And even though all the producers and even her husband were skeptical and still wanted Joan Crawford, Norma decided to go and have a professional photo shoot of her done posing provocatively in lingerie. Ooh, scandalous. And she gave that to her husband, who then agreed, you know what? You can play sexy. You can play this role. <laughs> so I'm like... Scandalous. Joan Crawford's statements were actually kind of true then. Because he was like, no, you shouldn't do it. And she's like, well, hey, look how sexy I am. You want some of this? Okay, baby, you can have it. I'm like, <laughs> scandalous, yes. <laughs> now, granted, I don't know how much of this is true. This is just stuff I it's, found. It's all I'm hearsay, you know, 100 years later. Yeah, yeah. But I was just like, kudos. <laughs> do what you got to do to get the role you want, I guess. She's like real go-getter. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's an interesting. That's an interesting anecdote. Yeah, so... um. The scene, not the scene, but the film opens with a scene, <coughs> as most films do. Really? <laughs> I watched this, I don't up. remember that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it threw me, because like, there, it's this opening in like this big cabin somewhere where they're like, all these people are out like, on a vacation, yeah, we're and it's like multiple party. floors that has like the big high ceiling, so you that can see both floors. That was a big ass cabin. Right. <laughs> Uh, you see both floors at once, and all these people are doing different things at different areas. Like, some are eating, some are dancing, some are talking. And to me, I'm like, this is a fucking play. This is the stage of a play. I, I thought the same thing. I, I was sitting there, I was like, <coughs> we're, we're, yeah, we're sitting down on Broadway. This is a play. Uh -huh. <laughs> Minus the musical part. Yeah, and then, like, you have this guy, like, standing by the front door, just, like, waiting for, uh, you know, Jerry to show up. Because he's, like, it's, it was Paul, I believe it was. Uh, he's, like, head over heels in love with her. And he's just, like, waiting for Jerry, waiting for Jerry. And then right behind him, even though you have this massive fucking cabin, right behind him, this guy and girl are just dancing right by the front fucking door. Yep. And I'm like, who dances by the front door when, like, right up next to somebody? I, fuck, I, who, who knows? Play. I, I, again, <laughs> they have to have everything in, in one shot. Yeah, so. Um, Jerry eventually shows up with Ted. And they've decided to get married. After playing hokey pokey by the lake, or by the river. Yeah. Oh, he's speaking up by the... They're down there, like, you know, hanging out and cuddling by the river and everything along this tree. And they're all like, we should really get back. And all of a sudden, this kid just pops out of my head. She's like, yeah, you guys need to go. And I'm like, where the fuck did he come from? He, he was he was the river goblin. <laughs> <laughs> if you answer these questions, three. <laughs> Wasn't a troll, just a goblin. I will take my fish, please. <laughs> Okay, anyways. Uh, <laughs> so they eventually come back to the cabin and are like, oh, we're, we're engaged, we're going to get married. And Paul's like, fucking bitch. Um, He's sitting there moping. And yeah. everyone, everyone was celebrating. He's just like... Mm. <laughs> He's like... <"Mer." laughs> <"Mer." It's> <laughs> and then for some reason they all get in their cars to go somewhere. I didn't catch... Oh, yeah, yeah, hold on. Ah, there it is. Thank there you. you. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. <laughs> um... But I didn't catch why they all left. But they all went in different cars. And Paul is like driving like a fucking maniac. Because he was drunk. Uh, this was one of the first PSAs against drunk driving. Really? Not intentionally. Oh, okay. I was like, <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, but it, it threw me because like, so they... <laughs> they well, kept, no, like they, they kept saying like, he's drunk, he's drunk. Should he be driving? Okay, I missed that part. Yeah, and they were all like, yeah, he's fine. And then like, she went up and talked to him and was like, are you sure you're okay to drive? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm good to go. You know, that type of stuff. Like, every red warning flag ever. And then, you know, proceed from there. <laughs> well, and then they have this, the, the footage of the car sped up to, like, 100. Yep. To where the car's like, vroom, vroom, vroom. Yep. But it's like, always oh, looks fake as fuck. Um, 
Well, they weren't actually driving a car. They, they, they were, you know, playing in a car that was on a set, and they had one of those little mat things behind them or whatever. Well, that's when it was zoomed in. It actually yeah. had, like, wider shots where the car was actually driving. Yeah. And that was, like, sped up. Yeah, they, they, it was, like, 100 frames a second or something exactly. ridiculous. Um, and then the woman, like, they're just driving. She's like, oh, ah! And then it shows the car. And then it shows them veer off the road. And yeah. I'm like, are you a fucking, like psychic like how pre like you just knew he was gonna fucking wreck all of a sudden maybe i, I based on how he was driving yes <laughs> but yeah i was just like she she screamed well before the car swerved and crashed um and uh, at first i was like did did, did he drive off the road because because it wasn't like he was just like and kind of fell over he was like <laughs> yeah so i'm like did, was maybe he, he was avoiding a pothole. suicide because jerry no, may, may have been trying to avoid... They didn't show it. May, may have been trying to avoid something in the road, or it could be any number of things. Yeah. Then again, I'm adding a lot of imagination to this scene <laughs> to try to make it make sense. <laughs> yeah, because he just veers off the road, uh, and then all of a sudden it, it shows them again. The car is, like, upside down, and they're all just standing there talking, except for one person that's on the ground, which uh, was... I think her name was Dorothy or something like that. That was... That was um, uh, what's her name? Sister. Yeah, I think her name was Dorothy. Um, and I guess she's like all scarred and everything uh, from the wreck. And Paul's all like, well, I guess I'll marry her. Because <laughs> like Jerry's well, cause, gone. Because and... he caused you know this this poor woman to, to be disfigured. And he's like, well, she's never going to marry because no one's going to want her. I guess I'll do it. Yeah, but this is also another one that was like, I was looking at it through today's perspective and yeah. I need to remember back yeah, we're, then. Yeah, we're, and we're, I'm like, the woman's not worth anything if she's not married to a dude. I mean, that <laughs> just makes no sense. Right. Um, but I'm also like, well, I guess back then, like, I don't, I don't know if that was, cause when there were at some point, like women weren't allowed to have jobs or something. I don't know. They, like, they weren't allowed to work. They weren't allowed to have bank accounts. They weren't allowed to have credit cards with anything without their husband's permission. Yeah. So, I mean, like I trying to look at it from that perspective was like, okay, I get it. But I was I have to separate today to it, then. It's it's really tough when because we've we've gone through this with a bunch of the movies yeah. that we've watched so far that it's really you have to like you said it's difficult sometimes to keep in mind that you are watching this that was made ninety years ago or, yeah. or however long it was. Um, it's it's tough to do that um, for some of these films. So I I, I get it because like you said you're applying you know twenty first century morals on you know, 18th or 19th century mores or yeah. more mores. Is that, is that the term mores? <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, so I guess he's going to marry her out of guilt because you know, everyone, he, he was drunk and crashed the man. car that screwed her up. He was suddenly sober. Then apparently a car wreck, a car crash up. will wake you the <laughs> hell up. Yes. <laughs> but then Paul and Dorothy disappear. We're going to put them over here on this little like ledge for the next, you know, 45 minutes. Um, they will come back. Just yeah, not yeah. For a while. We're just putting a little, little bit of put a pin. We're, we're going to put a pin in it. <laughs> um, and then it kind of like flashes forward, and Ted and Jerry have gotten married. Um, and I wanted to point this out. Multiple scenes shows them talking to each other about how much they love each other. Yes, over and over and over again. And I'm like, that's not real. But also, they had no fucking chemistry. No, <laughs> it seemed fake as fuck yes and i'm just like do you guys not do screen tests back then no or is like you did a screen test and she wasn't good enough but hey she was in lingerie so i'm gonna let my wife do this it, it's hey the boss says this is what's going down this is what's going down yeah so it was, it was it was hard to believe them and everything like that but anyways um so i guess he's i didn't catch what he does for a living but he has to travel a lot he, he was like a salesman or some shit because he went to different he, he had uh he spent a lot of time out of town Mm -hmm. they, they talked about him like just getting back from Chicago for, you know, a week or two. And then there was some other city he was going to right yeah, afterwards. Yeah. Um, well, they're, they're at some like party to celebrate their third year anniversary. I think yeah, it third was. anniversary. Um, and they come home with some people. And I don't know who this person was, but they mentioned this guy at the party owns Arkansas and Texas. Uh, it you was, could own a state. <laughs> you, I, I, that was more of a, a figure of speech, I think, because the the guy was um, one of the coworkers. Like, if you were responsible for, say, product from your company going to Arkansas or Texas, then I could see them. Okay, in, like using you, sales you don't own the state, but, but you, you are the representative every, that 
towards that so you exactly. own that yes. that area okay that makes more sense because i'm like uh, i'm pretty sure he can't own the state no but like <laughs> like if if you were a salesman and you were responsible for texas or arkansas yeah your bot you know i you, own those territories as far yes, as that's that makes a lot that. more sense damn you applying logic <laughs> uh <laughs> sorry my bad <laughs> I just liked the idea of some dude owning the state. <laughs> no, that would have been France before it was sold to the U.S. in 1804. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, also, while they're at this party, some guy comes in, like, being loud and annoying as fuck was apparently some kind of shitty-ass comedian for no fucking reason. Uh, that one was, yeah, that was very jarring. It was That was the dude with the... Oh, sorry correction <laughs> um that was the dude with the music box right like the, yeah the, the he, and then he like, like put the, it down and like stripped down to something else and was being yeah like he he looked like a it was oh man so i was watching this and i'm like he's playing up as like the worst italian stereotype because he, he keeps throwing like the letter a in front of words mm. um and then he you know he had the little the little whirly gig jukebox or whatever it was and then, oh, I'm fine. I'm just going to take this off, and I'm just going to dance around and be an idiot. Yeah, and then you never see him again for the rest of the film, if I recall. I, I he he showed up once. Did he? Okay. Yeah, but it wasn't like the. But he he wasn't being that. It, okay. it wasn't being an ass. No. Well, while while that ass is in the the living room, thank you. Um, Ted goes into the kitchen with to speak to another woman that gave him some ass uh, while he was uh, away. Um, <laughs> That that was weird. Like she, um, they, she, she just, just like happened. came in with the comedian and everything. Yeah, like she. That. They they happened. They they mentioned they ran into her at like some nightclub they went to. Yeah, and they're like, she says she knows you, Ted. And then suddenly, like it just happens to be the the one person he's having an affair with. Yeah, I don't know how many times they, but they did it at least once. And she's like wanting a second piece, and he's just like, no, while well, my wife's around, go away. This is not happening. This is not the right time. But last yeah. week was fine. Yeah. Um. And, like, he's in the kitchen, like, making a drink or something like that. And she follows him in there and is all, like, getting up close and essentially just trying to, like, when are you going to come and, you know, be in my bed again and all this kind of shit. And he's like, you know, go away. And that's when Jerry walks in and sees them and doesn't even, like, really react. You can tell she sees she, something's she knew. going on. She knew. But she's just kind of like, okay. And walked back out after she, like, said a few words to them. Yeah, she knew. Uh, but as she walked out, Ted followed all of 10 seconds later, followed her into her bedroom and she had already changed her clothes. <laughs> she, she's one of those, um, uh, speed those quick changes. Yeah. Whoosh. Quick change. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this, I had a very guttural, like what the fuck reaction to this that came next, but He's in the bedroom with her, and Jerry starts questioning Ted's fidelity, because obviously what she just saw and right. everything in the kitchen. Um, and he tells her, look at it like a man would. Right. Uh, essentially saying that he should be able to fuck whoever he wants, because men have urges, you know? And, you know, I should do what I want because I have a penis, and you should just be happy that I'm coming back home kind of thing. Um, and he says it doesn't mean a thing like five fucking times. Yeah. And I was just like, <sighs> yeah, wasn't, uh, it was, it was at that point that, uh, movie kind of lost me. Like, cause I mean, like it was fine up until that point. I'm like, all right, he's, he's a total douche yeah. and I don't give a crap what happens to him for the rest of this movie. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, I would hope, uh, most faithful husbands would have an issue with the way he spoke to his fucking wife that was not cool um but yeah he essentially was just like just fucking deal with it you know i gotta get my shit wet every now and then and uh, you know it's fine it, it doesn't mean a thing uh and then he's like oh and by the way i gotta go to chicago today yeah I i'm leaving i had a train in an hour <laughs> <laughs> and so he takes off and the rest of the party like goes to dinner like he may have come to dinner for a little bit and then took off um, but they all go to dinner and that woman he was sleeping with went with them. And so she's having to have dinner with this, you know, woman that's screwing her husband. And I'm just like, what? 
tell her to go away. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that hard to say you're not invited. You, you can't go. Um, yeah, so he tries to like call her uh, from like the train station or whatever when yeah, she's gotten he, back home. Yeah, he's out of town. And during this time, like while he's trying to like, can you just connect, try, you know, everything, uh, Dawn has like supposed to be a that was you his know, buddy yeah a friend of theirs uh had taken her back home and he was clearly like a little tipsy uh and he became creepy as fuck um essentially kind of like getting all close to her and everything like that um i don't know if they meant it that way but to me i'm like don's trying to snap him off a piece that that's exact i, that, I, I caught the same type of thing because they, they'd just been out drinking her before and he's like Hey, I you know might be able to get myself a little here, mm-hmm. and then yeah, yeah, and then uh, it was essentially Ted cheated. Oh no, no, let me let me read the synopsis. Um, Ted was unfaithful her unfaithful to her, so she decides to respond to his infidelities in kind. Yep, by fucking Don. Yep. Um, yeah, so she goes and does that with Don. Uh, and then comes back home, and I think she felt a little guilty about doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then Ted, like, comes back home, and he's just trying to, like, you know, hey, we're good now, right? You know, I'm back home. Like, you had some Everything's time to cool off. Everything's just fine. Yeah. It didn't mean a thing. Mm. <laughs> and then, before he knows that she cheated, Ted says this line, I never knew how much I loved you. And I'm like, it took cheating on your wife of three years who you were claiming all this love stuff to as you were getting married to know how much you loved her? Yeah, and that was him trying to, you know, I'll turn on the schmooze a little bit mm-hmm. and get back in her good graces even though I'm a horrible piece of trash. Yeah, and then Jerry's just kind of like, you know what? I feel horrible about this, but I did it too. And then Ted loses his shit. Yep. Um, he gets so upset that Jerry cheated on him and he doesn't know who with and how like, I look like a fool because you cheated on me. Even and I'm though, like, you have no room to be mad, motherfucker. Again, again, 1930s. That may have been acceptable in those times. I, dude, I don't know. Um, he's still a piece of shit. Yeah. I mean, like unequivocally, he, he essentially told her, get over it. That I cheated on you. Yep. Wait, you cheated on me? Now, How much of a horrible fucking person are you? Yeah. You know, I'm like, come on. Yeah, that she's she's not not spoiled. You know, she's she's been with someone else other than me. I can't yeah. have this. I can't stand for that. Fuck you, dude. <laughs> yeah, no, no doubt. Um, so obviously, well, not obviously, but Ted's like, I can't deal with this shit. We're getting divorced. And I don't know if you caught this, but I was like, fucking seriously. It took the Supreme Court for them to get a divorce? Um, so... How many divorces does the Supreme Court handle? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I would imagine back in those days it was not an easy thing to get a divorce. So it may have been... But the Supreme Court, like the may biggest have, court of the land, is dealing with divorce been, cases? It may not have been the Supreme Court of the United States. Even if it's the Supreme Court of that state, the Supreme <laughs> fucking Court, because it literally flash showed the Supreme Court right. and then showed them getting a divorce. Yeah. And actually, if I recall, he wasn't even there. She was there. Yeah, it was, it was a no fault type of thing. Um, the Supreme I, Court it, it, it was very important. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it was just one of those, like, uh, throw something on there. All right, cool. Got it. Yeah. You got it, boss. Oh, God. It's all done. But yeah, then, like, Ted takes off. Jerry starts being like, all right, well, you know, I fooled around with two guys now. And she starts becoming a, a what I'll say, loose woman in the sense that she's dating around a ton. But from what I picked up, and I want to know if you picked up the same way or if you had a different kind of interpretation of it. It seemed that she was dating a ton, but not having sex with any of them. Yeah, she she was kind of like just seeing a bunch of people at the same time. Yeah, like she was like flirting, maybe doing a little kissing, but she wasn't going farther than that from what I was able to pick up. I, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Because like all these guys were like fawning over and she's like, oh, I don't know. No, we can't. She's, she's you know. playing hard to get. Yeah. Um. So she's kind of, I don't know if, if living her best life sort of thing, but she's living her life. Uh, <laughs> she's living a life. <laughs> without Ted. Well, I don't know if she considered 
that her best at the time, and then well, eventually no, she, decided she was it wasn't having good fun. Enough. And like he, like because there was that one scene where, um, what's his name, uh, the buddy that she cheated Don. with, Don. Thank you. Um, ran into her ex husband at this diner. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, man, if I ever find out who that is, I'm gonna kill him. And he's like, well, I'm just gonna slink out of back this way. Like, well, yeah. When you do that, yeah. Hope it all goes well for you. But hey, when you're back in town, he, well, like he mentioned, he was just, just like he, he's going all over the world for yeah. whatever job he was doing. Like he was in Paris, he was in London, doing all this kinds of stuff. Because he owns Paris and London, uh, apparently. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but no, he's gallivanting all over the place, and you know, he's. They said, hey, I'm, I'm going to try and see if I can drink for free this entire month in Paris. Like, oh, that's yeah. that's cool. Good for you, bro. But he didn't, uh, I think that it was mentioned that he wasn't seeing people. He was just like, like, almost going like through like a depression kind of thing. Because yeah. he was like drinking all the time yeah. and getting into fights and whatnot. Um, and while he ran into Don, Jerry runs into Paul on a train when she was like flirting with some guy. So, some uh, uh, Ivan was that his name? Ivan? Maybe. Ivan. Um, but it was just like a, another proof that like every guy in this film is a fucking creep. Yep. And Ted cheats on her, his wife, and just says like fucking deal with it, bitch. You know that kind of. I'm like, eh. uh, <laughs> and then like Don's like, hey, your husband's not here. Try this one. You know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, and then. Uh, Paul, who is married to Dorothy, who he mutilated for being drunk, driving, and wrecking over his love for Jerry, makes a play for Jerry. Yes. And like, oh, I'll, I'll leave Dorothy. She'll be fine. She doesn't care. She's good. This marriage has meant nothing. It's fine. I can end it, and then I get to go be happy with you. Yeah, and I'm just like, every Bro. guy in this film is a fucking jerk. Yeah. Um, and then like get, we get to meet the disfigured Dorothy. And I say meat very loosely because you don't see her face. She doesn't have like, you know, they didn't use like prosthetics or anything. They, no, they just put just, like they, a black they, yeah, veil on her. Yeah, a veil her. over her face. Yeah, and she like shows up. She's like, uh, where do you get this idea that I don't want to be with you and I'm good with you being with her? Like, you're my husband. What the hell? I love you. Um, and he he was still like, well, shut up. You don't love me. I'm going to go get this piece over here where it's not right. messed up. Uh, and Jerry's the one that's like, no, we're not doing this. Like, I didn't really feel right about this to begin with, but knowing that she still wants to be with you, no. Um, it has to be like kind of the voice of reason, you know? Um, but the movie up to that point is like, it's doing all this stuff playing up how Jerry was wrong for cheating. Yep. But nothing is ever done to say how Ted was wrong for cheating. I, I knew... Based on how they did stories back in those days, that even though he was this horrendous piece of shit, he's going to get back with her and he's going to get the girl and win the story. Which is what exactly happens, because we're right at the end there. Yep. Jerry decides, she hears like how Ted is in Paris and he's not doing well, and Jerry's like, okay, I'm going to go to Paris. And she goes to all these nightclubs, finally finds him. They reunite and they kiss. And, and love is reborn. Yep. And credits. Yep. Fuck you, Ted. <laughs> I, I, I was fine spoiling the end of this movie. If you were well, we were right at the end anyway. Because I did not like this movie at all. See, and here... At all. This is a weird thing. I didn't like the movie either. But... It's still a contender for me. Because of the reaction. It, it, it pulled me in so much to the point that I'm like, You fucking prick how the fuck could you do this to your wife right. how are you so fucking saintly when you it, it, dipped it, it, in it, another pussy and she's the wrong like it got such a visceral reaction to me that i'm like pulled right. in and I'm like it did its job in my opinion I, I i would agree with that um to the point that the actor did what they exactly what they were supposed to do you had a you had an emotional reaction to yep. what they were dealing with everyone in this movie was terrible all of them <laughs> and I would be just fine never seeing this movie again. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying I'll watch it again. I'm just saying that it 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 wasn't like some of the movies where I was, where I was like, can it fucking end already? Like yeah. I was in it, and I'm just like, you piece of shit, you piece of shit, you're also a piece of shit. Like yeah. <laughs> it, it 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 took me along for the journey. <laughs> I, I get that. I get that. It was not my. I mean, it wasn't my favorite movie. Everyone, all the characters were were terrible. 
um, Jerry may have had some redeemable qualities and then, you know, she's going to get back with the dude that cheated on her in the first place that started this, this whole romp of, you know, things. Um, I hope you're happy. Enjoy yeah. it. Well, see, I'm, I don't have a problem with them necessarily getting back together because people can make mistakes. And, you know, if you guys feel that, you know, you love each other and you're able to get past the mistakes and you've learned from your mistakes, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's a story we've seen time and time again yes. in film. I'm fine with that. Um, the part that threw me was just the fact that it was so emphasis on, like, I'm a dude. I've got a dick. Let me put it where I want to put it. But you keep that pussy tight. You know, that kind of shit. I'm like, <sighs> We're so going to get demonetized for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube is going to hear this shit, and they're just going to be like, nope. Ah, we're like it. We're like fucking an hour and a half in. YouTube doesn't care. Uh, uh, that's <laughs> fine. They they use auto-transcribing software. They're going to see it. They're going to see it. But yeah, just that, that that's the part that bothered me. Right. Um, but then, like I said, at the same time, I don't think they were intending it this way, cause based on when the film was made. But it got such a reaction out of me that I'm right. just like, to me, the film did a good job of telling a story because it got an emotional response out of me. Mm-hmm. Um, Honestly, I, 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 <laughs> no, like I, I, I try not to, because um, like right after that, where he's just like, you know what, let me do what I want, you deal with it, and you know, just be happy that I come home to you. I'm like, this dude's a piece of shit. I'm. This is supposed to be the you know, the guy that she's pining after, you know, the sort the, uh, sort of hero of this movie. Mm-hmm. I just kind of like, all right, I just kind of lean back on the couch and I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll finish it, but I'm not really, <laughs> like, I'm not, you know, in tune with what's yeah. going on. I'm, I'll follow along with the story and I'll see where it goes. It was, it was after that point where I'm like, this is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me though. No worries. Um, any final thoughts before jumping into the big house? I, I, I like I said, I wasn't a fan. Um, I, I, I get. I mean, I, I understand where you're coming from with like the it got the got the emotional reaction. Um, I was kind of the different just because I'm like, man, everyone in this movie's terrible. This is there's no, uh, there's no. Hmm, how do I want to put this? <laughs> there's no like redeeming qualities of any of these people. And at the end, sure, if they're happy together, great. You know, good for you. You went on this romp of an adventure because you guys cheated. He cheated first, and then she cheated on him. And now everybody's hunky-dory. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like, the Jerry character, I didn't think it had, was as much of a... Like, I didn't, I didn't think she was a bad character. No, but it... Because um, to me, like, she didn't really cheat because he cheated. She was in such a distraught state right, and had yeah. been drinking. Yeah. Shit happened. She felt remorseful about it and yeah. wanted to tell him. So to me, I'm like, she, I don't feel, was the bad character in the I, movie. I would, okay. All the men yeah. were jackasses. Yeah, I, I, I would, okay, let me, I apologize for, um, Jerry was fine. Yeah. Um, she was taken advantage of and decided to, to, you know, kind of do her own thing. Um, but past that point, like, when she decided to get back with douchebag number one, okay, not, not something I would, I would have proposed, but... If they're yeah. happy, great. Yeah, I'll give you that one. Eh, whatever. <laughs> not, not. I was not a. I was not a fan of the film. All right. Well, let's change the that big asshole Ted to the big house. Um, the big house Ted. <laughs> which we get to deal with Ted again, but under a different name. Um, it's always fucking Ted. <laughs> all right. So the big house uh, was directed by George W. Hill and Ward Wing. Wing the the double W, um, <laughs> dub, <laughs> bit, dub dub in the house. <laughs> <laughs> dub dub. <laughs> All right, so we had a production budget of four hundred and fourteen thousand. That was a lot of money in those days. But every other movie we've been looking at is at least around the million for the most part. So yeah. I was like, that's like half the budget of most of these films. Um, and it was another best film nominee at the nineteen thirty Academy Awards. Stars once again. Uh, for the third time, I believe we've seen him. Uh, Chester Morris as Morgan. Big Chester. Uh, Wallace Beery as Butch. Beery. Ding. <laughs> uh, Robert Montgomery as Kent, which was uh, Don in The Divorcee. Mm-hmm. And Leela Hyams as Anne. And this is a, a convict falls in love with his new cellmate's sister. 
only to become embroiled in a planned breakout, which is certain to have lethal consequences. So, fun anecdote about Wallace Beery. Um, he was a very big, popular actor in the silent film era. Um, and this kind of propelled him back into the limelight during the sound films. And mm -hmm. less than two years after this movie was made, he was one of the highest paid actors in Hollywood. Yep. Yeah. As soon as uh, I've read that too, like as soon as they like transitioned to talkies, like he pretty much like lost all his work for like a year or two. That happened a lot for silent film actors transitioning into motion pictures with sound. Um, some, a lot of them uh, couldn't speak English. And so they were just kind of like, what do we do? Like, well, mm -hmm. we can't, we can't do this. And then they just kind of fell into obscurity. Makes sense. But yeah, I'd read that too. Like he, this was his jumping off point that suddenly he became the highest paying actor out there. And I was mm -hmm. like, way to go, man. Um, I actually liked his character in this too. Uh, <laughs> Machine gun butch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, ch to your point, Chester Morris was also an alibi. I didn't list it here. Dude was in everything. <laughs> Uh, this was the first film to receive an Academy Award for Best Sound. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a, and then Douglas Shearer uh, won the very first Academy Award for Best Sound with this film, and he would go on to win another twelve Oscars, uh, both in competitive and uh, technical categories. And so I was like, "Damn, dude, <laughs> that's a lot of Oscars." Hey, he won. But it was probably like the actors. They had like seven actors back then. They had like two sound guys. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it was fifty fifty chance he's going to win every year. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just saying. I want to say the the screenplay for this movie. Um, was it this one that was written by Francis something? I don't know. I didn't look up the writer, which I've actually thought about adding the writers to this list. But that, no. that would probably be probably be good because one I I want to say it was for this movie or it may have been. Um, yeah, I want to say it was this movie. It it was. Um, I'll have to look up her name and we can add it later. But she. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She this was, was a, written by a woman. Yeah. Yeah, and she won the Oscar for best screenplay yeah. for the as the first female mm -hmm. to win an Oscar in a non acting role. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. This. This. Uh, yeah. That. Okay. So that was this movie. We. I need to look up her name so she gets credit because that's going to bother me. You can do it. Go ahead. Give me. Give me two yeah, seconds. Yeah. you're doing we'll, that? we'll continue. I will add it in a moment. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, oh, actually, I had a same that like Robert Montgomery, who uh, we saw in this one and The Divorcee, and then Chester Morris we saw in this, The Divorcee and Alibi. I do wonder if we're going to see Chester Morris in anything else we're going to watch. Maybe. And it was Francis Marion. That's that. That's who wrote this. So, mad props. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, so, we start this film... Um, and this is going to be a weird one. Like, I feel like the film starts, like, it's, it's hinting it's going to be about this person, but then it's not. It's about this person. But, yep. So it starts off with uh, Kent, played by Kent, Robert Montgomery. Kent Marlowe. Uh, was that his last name? Yep. Okay. Uh, Kent is uh, dropped off a, at a prison uh, where he's getting 10 years for manslaughter from drunk driving. Yep. Killed somebody when he was drunk. Yep. So he's being... Sorry, I know you can hear my daughter screaming. She's like, in the room next wow. door. <laughs> She, she's a freaking banshee. <laughs> oh, she's scream. Goodness, uh, eventually, I'll have a room that maybe has like some soundproofing to be able to record <laughs> this stuff. But yeah, not not so much. Um, so uh, he's being dropped off. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, he's being <laughs> dropped off at prison uh, for manslaughter. And uh, they they comment like while he's being dropped off. That they're like, you know, they're like, we don't have room for him. He's like, well, you gotta take him anyway. He's like, well, we only have room for 1,800, but we're currently housing 3,000. And I'm like, probably happened back then and foreshadows what probably still happens today. It absolutely happens today. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but yeah, I was just like, Jesus. Uh, and then, of course, the cell. And I don't know. Six I, I only know I only know prison cells from film and TV. I've obviously never been in a prison cell. Well, not obviously. I've never been in a prison cell. Um but it threw me that like this this cell was way smaller than what I'm used to seeing in like modern movies. Six by six. And so I'm like, is modern movies lying to us? They just make them bigger so they can yes. fit the camera in there. Yes. Because <laughs> absolutely. Geez. Yeah. Oh, most man. most most prison cells are six or six feet by six feet. Mm. And then with with that one, a cot's taking up two feet, so you got four by six. Mm, man, sounds like a chunk of wood. Um. <laughs> it was not a good time. <laughs> no. Uh, so Kent gets put in the same prison cell as uh, Butch and Morgan. Machine gun. Butch. And while they're being brought, while he's being brought in, like Butch realizes that Kent has cigarettes and steals them, and 
makes like uh like he like knocks Kent out, I think, yeah, and like shoves him, him up in his sh- bed. Well he like he, he tried to squeal to a guard to like he stole his cigarettes. Yeah, and he's, and he's like, like bitch. He's, he's like, Did you steal him? No, officer, I didn't. You're gonna get and then he threatened Kent, like, you're starting trouble, I'm gonna throw you in the hole for a month. And then like cop left and then he knocked him out and stole the cigarettes anyway. Yeah. Uh but then like he throws him up in the top bunk. Yep. And Butch is like, Yeah, I got me some cigarettes now. And Morgan's like, Give him his fucking cigarettes. Why do I want to give him his fucking cigarettes? And he's like, Fine. And he puts him in there. And then, like, Butch gets in bed, and Morgan's like, And he steals him himself. <laughs> you know? I was just like, Man. <laughs> oh, he's, he's a cool cat. Yeah. Um, so, the next morning, they're all in the yard. And some guys come up to Kent. And just say, hey, you know, the warden wants to see you, or the captain, or whoever he's sending it to. He's like, he's like, why, why does he want to see me? He's like, you got parole. He's like, really? Yeah. And he starts running off, and I'm like, you really thought you got early parole after one night when you're sentenced to ten years for manslaughter? They, they may not have like, sh- like that particular scene. Like they, I think they were trying to illustrate that. I don't think it was the first night. I think he'd been there for a little bit. So that, that morning in the yard, you think, wasn't the next morning? I don't think it was the next morning, no. Okay, because it sure seemed that way to me. Because that would have... Like, I mean, that's fucked up. Like, I mean, especially after... Uh, well, because if he's been there a while, wouldn't he know some of these people? Like, that whole scene starts him getting to know people. Yeah, but that's... Maybe... I don't know. Because they didn't really... They, they had the little calendar thing that they were using to illustrate the, the passage of time. But that was later, though. That didn't yeah, happen right Yeah, but they then. didn't show it right at the beginning. Yeah, so I, I I still felt it was the next morning. Maybe I could be wrong. I don't know. I, I may have I may have completely misinterpreted Writer that. and director of this film, please call me and let me... Oh, wait. They are um, dead. <laughs> that's the fun of watching like some of these movies that are so freaking old. You're like, that person's probably not alive anymore and i'm watching their films still that's that, that's that's neat though like no it is yeah I'm like, like if i'm doing some homework on these movies and i'll look it up i'm like that guy died in 1965 that guy died in 1988 that guy died in 2000 that guy and died five years after the movie was made <laughs> yeah uh but yeah so um that i thought was funny uh and then i didn't write down i was like trying to write as i'm like watching the film i didn't write when this line was so maybe you can remember because it was still like we're out there in the yard uh but they this line give that lady the swellest funeral she ever had do you remember what scene that was from that was when um butch was talking about um he had received a letter um from the mailman and he was reading it to um morgan Mm -hmm. his buddy um, Morgan was reading it to him because he was, he was somewhat illiterate. Yeah. Um, and he was telling him it was, it was a letter that it was a family friend had written. That that's it was right. Like his, his mother. aunt or something had died, his, his right? His mother had his died. Mother? Oh, his mother died. Okay. That's right. Um, I just remember the line, give that lady the swellest funeral she ever had. And I'm like, how many fucking funerals has she had? Um, I, I think it was, I don't think he meant. I, I, I know what one. he meant, but I was just like the, the, the verbiage of it. I'm like, yeah. that makes it infer that there's more than one funeral but make this the swellest one she's ever had yeah it, no it'd be like this is the best he was referring i'm gonna give her the best send off i can yeah no i get it i just yeah. <laughs> I took issue with the way it was phrased i'm like she, she's you only get one she's had at least four it could be the shittiest shittiest funeral ever it'll still be the swellest one she ever had well technically yes <laughs> all right i thought this was awesome well maybe not awesome but funny um they decide to bet on a roach race. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, <laughs> they're just the, playing in the yard, grab some roaches, and they're going to like put them on a piece of uh, cardboard, and there's like a circle on it, which everyone mm-hmm. crosses the thing. And the one in the center is not moving, and then like Morgan, because they all bet on it, and Butch wins. And Morgan reaches and grabs it, flips it over, and like was... when, when Butch had went like this, went whoosh, to blow on him before putting him on the board, he put gum on the back of the roach <laughs> yeah. and stuck it to the board, and so it couldn't move. He's just like... They were rigging the game. <laughs> They were trying to cheat. Uh, but I just thought it was funny. Like, roach race and then, like, gum on the roach. It just, that just made me crack up a little bit. I mean, I, I get it. You're in prison. Not much else to do. You're going to invent some games. Yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Um, and then, at this point, you know, they've, they've had some time in the yard. Um, and then I thought this was a slightly interesting shot. Nothing groundbreaking, but just interesting. It showed, like, the mess hall. And then this, like, little transition from empty to all of a sudden everyone's there. Yeah. I was like, I was like, ah. It's kind of interesting. Uh, it, it's 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 easier to do that to transition between like showing them march in, you know, line by line or whatever or however they do it, 
Yeah, that that's a lot of people in one big room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I just I went ahead and wrote that down. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but then <laughs> they're in there and eating the food, and they're not liking the food, and Butch starts like bitching about the food. And, the prison and riot. Food fight. <laughs> They start flinging their gruel around, and um, then the the police o- or the uh, guards up along the top start putting rounds into the wall as warnings. You see mm-hmm. the little puffs of smoke, and like Butch, sit down, or the next one's going right into you. Like, okie dokie. Like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> but then I think because like because he started this whole like rabble, rabble, uh, <laughs> rabble, rabble, rabble. Anyways, um, they're gonna go put him in the hole. Well, we saw earlier in the yard when he got mad at uh, Morgan for a minute, he pulled a knife out, like a little shiv, mm-hmm. kind of held it up to Morgan and then put it back away. Um, so since he's going to be pat down, he's like putting it and he's like, they're like, you see him passing the, the shiv mm-hmm. amongst the people below the table and he gets all the way over to Kent. And I, I'm confused with Kent. Kent gets the shiv and hides it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, why is he suddenly helping Butch and uh, Morgan? Because Butch and Morgan, Butch knocked him the fuck out and they stole his cigarettes. Yep. The the older gentleman that was in the prison yard in that earlier scene had was talking to Kent and he told him, get in with their gang and if you learn shit, you can rat them out and they'll take years off your sentence. Yeah, see, but and I, I was actually going to get to a bit of that, so I'm glad you brought it up. <sighs> It didn't come across as he took it as like he was doing that. He was like helping them sort of. Well, maybe that's what they meant and they just didn't play it off very well. Yeah, he, he was he was like, yeah, I'll hold your knife for you. Trying to get in their good graces. Yeah, because then once they're in the um, cell again, he still has the, I almost said switch. He, almost, he still has the shank. He's, he's got the shiv. Uh, the shiv. Uh, the shiv. Uh, and like right as they're coming into like toss the the cell to check for stuff he shoves it under like the pillow uh for morgan because butch is you know in solitary uh and it just first he's like holding the knife and then he like plants it on morgan who we find out was going to be getting out on parole in like a week it was the day after oh the day after the so day after all the next day and i'm just curious did kent get time off his sentence because it never showed him talk to anybody to get that he was going to rat stuff out to get time off his sentence. It never showed he did get time off his sentence. For, and why in the hell would you be fucking with a dude that's getting out the next day? For that particular scene, I don't think it was him trying to get Morgan in trouble intentionally. Because it was a surprise pat down slash cell inspection. He's like, I need to get rid of this now. And it really didn't matter. It just happened to be Morgan's coat that he stuffed it into because that was the first place he saw. That's the first place I'm going to. And then I, you know, I don't have that on me. Yeah, and see, and that's where the disconnect was because you brought up that guy saying, get in with him and rat on him. Yeah. And I'm like, if he was trying to do that, because like, that's how I, it played to me. Like, he was suddenly helping and then he's like, oh shit, like, there's somebody here, like, hide this. Right. And he, and Morgan got in trouble. So I'm like, well, was he helping them and was an oh shit moment hide this? Or was he trying to get time off his sentence that he was like trying to rat them out? Why was their cell suddenly being tossed? I'd like It was just a just random inspection. It's it just poor timing. They they did mention um towards the end of the movie, and we'll we'll get to it in a bit, um, that he, he was actually informing on them, um, in, in an effort to get, you know, time taken off of his sentence. Was but, it I didn't catch that he was act- actively doing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I don't think that was what he was trying to do in this particular case. He was trying to dump the knife and dump it quick. Okay. Well, that caused Morgan to be taken to solitary too. And now we get to have one of my favorite shots in cinema. We get to have a discussion between Morgan and Kent for like a minute and a half where we just stare at a hallway and we don't see the people. Well, they were in... <laughs> They were in solitary. They're not going to show them. Cut between each of them back and forth. They like were in do. the dark. There are no lights in the hole. Light? I, I don't know. Do something to where you can see them. Like we do in all movies today. Um, I, thought, I know I it's a hundred years of, ago, but I just hate that kind of shot. I thought, I show thought, me them! 
I thought their their dialogue was pretty funny with them kind of badgering back and forth. I barely remember their fucking dialogue other than like Butch being like, what are you doing down here? What happened? Um, beyond that, I don't remember it because I was just staring like the stupid fucking hallway. <laughs> <laughs> that happened. Oh, that's a cut. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have violent sneezes. Like he's, he's to the point not, that, like my wife, she's like, "What the?" F-? He he always has, always has. It, it's like his soul is temporarily leaving his body. Yeah. It's like, Wah! and then he rips it back in. It was like, uh, like that scene in the Frighteners where, like, that one dude's dying, and he's like, "No, you're not." <laughs> oh, That's oh a great God. movie, by the way. If no one, if 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 you guys are looking for a good. Uh, recommendation uh peter jackson's the frighteners with michael j fox and i've seen it once it's been oh a long it's time. fan i love that movie it's so good <laughs> sorry no, no but, you're good don't mean to sidetrack but it was the first thing i, I thought a of. giant man sneeze there so um okay so yeah they had all those discussions in solitary and everything like that shot from a fucking hallway um and then when they're getting let out of solitary mm-hmm. morgan escapes by faking his own death Yes. And they don't call a doctor to check his fucking pulse or that, breathing, well, put a fucking mirror under his no, nose, nothing. No, so they, they did. Like they, so after he was done with the hole, like he was on the stretcher, um, they said he's going to be fine. They took him to the infirmary, and the doctor checked him out and said he'll be fine. But how he got out was that there was another dude that died that they were going to wheel him out in an ambulance. And then after the lights went out... They didn't have anybody there to watch him, nor did they actually, like, secure him to the bed. So after all the lights went out, he just got up and then went to the infirmary and then escaped via the ambulance with the dead dude. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I don't think I remembered seeing the dead dude. But they, I also they, they, watched they six show... fucking movies across a week, so they, they're all they, like... <laughs> yeah, they didn't show him, but they... they, they 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 said he had died and they were going to take him to a morgue okay in in a in a um in an ambulance some of his audio is sometimes hard to hear so maybe that's why i missed it but cuz i knew i remember the scene with like him being in the other room and stuff like that but i'm just like anyways he escapes so he gets out of prison yes and i don't know if he was initially planning on killing her but morgan goes and finds Anne, which he had met when she was there visiting her brother earlier. Kent, Kent Marlowe. Yeah. She was there visiting Kent. Um, and apparently he saw her for all of like five fucking seconds and remembered her and somehow knew her name and where she lived and her social security number and all this kind of stuff. Um, before we move on from that, I was reading that supposedly in the initial script for this... They were supposed to be they husband and wife. They were supposed to be husband and wife. I've read that, yeah, yeah. And that did not go over well with audiences, and so they're like, mm, let's switch it and make them be, you know, brother and sister because of them, her cheating on her husband with, you know, with with, 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 with uh, Morgan. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I saw, I read that too. Which we had a movie called The Divorcee, and that was fine, but these cheating people are wrong. No, yeah, this, this <laughs> is the the epic. You it, know. It's okay for for Ted to cheat on his wife. But it's not okay for Morgan, the same actor, to have sex with a woman who's cheating on her husband. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fucking 1930s. S- social mores in the 1930s made no sense. Yeah. So, anyways. Morgan finds Anne, and Anne actually remembers him, even though I don't remember in that scene her ever even seeing him in that room of 30 plus people. I don't think she remembered him from the the actual prison part because they they showed right before that them putting out wanted posters with his picture on it like them printing out a bunch of them didn't catch that either that might have been happening while i was like writing notes down yeah that, uh, my that's that's where i think that she recognized him from yeah i don't was think from I, the wanted i never posters. saw the scene with the uh hey did i even watch this fucking movie did you <laughs> god which what, what did you watch I, I, I watched Big Mama's House. That's what I watched. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to get to, I was like, I swear Martin Lawrence was in this somewhere. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know what? That, that, <laughs> that could be a fun game. We're like, 
You're like, all right, we're going to watch The Big House, and then we watch two entirely separate movies that just have house in the name somewhere. And you're just like, and then what we, the fuck? No, like, how is it so different? Yeah. That's the game. You try and figure out what the hell movie the other person watched. <laughs> oh, Jesus So you Christ. watched Big Mama's House. I watched Man of the House with Jonathan Taylor Thomas. <laughs> What oh, the hell did he well, do? Isn't there like, oh, there's like Sorority House, I think. Yep, there's... Um, uh, house Bunny. Um. Uh, house Bunny, yeah, I was just thinking that. <laughs> What's that one with Tommy Lee Jones? Was that House Bunny or was that another one? I thought that was Sorority House. Oh, the, okay, yeah. yeah, then yeah. yeah. Oh, guys. Uh, <laughs> Little House in the Prairie? I don't know. We um, <laughs> I love how fun, like, I was like, I pulled that out of the Big Mama's house. <laughs> just, just, just randomly, I'm, I'm gonna mix things up and I'll watch We Bought a Zoo with Matt Damon. That's a good fucking flick. Is it really? Have you seen it? No? I have not. No. It's a great movie. I love that movie. I, I own that movie. I, I like it a lot. I did not know. I, yeah. I haven't seen it. Um, I would say give it a watch. It, I, I think it'll hit it, you it's differently more family now. Family friendly type of thing. Yeah, right? but I think it'll hit you way differently now, um, because uh, like I, I have kids and I've had kids for a while. Um, and the the film is still great, but being a parent makes that I get it. flick hit a little better. I get it. Um, anyways, um, so at this point is where I was referencing earlier where I felt the movie was supposed to be about Kent, but because it shows him getting dropped off at prison. But for the vast majority of this movie, it's been about more about Morgan, it, and it was, now it's showing Morgan outside, and he's getting acquainted with Anne. It, it was it was Chester Morris. He's the big name. Yeah, yeah. I just it. Since it opened with Kent, I thought it was going to be about Kent. But, um, so it starts being about, you know, Morgan and Anne. Like, they just, out of the blue, just fall in love. They didn't show how long he had been out of prison. It True. may have been a while. True. He was out long enough that he had a job. And, like, I guess the, the cops came sniffing around. And so then he moved and got a job somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they like kind of found him there and like, I think he was supposed to be coming to like some dinner or something. And he he, he said up. he was leaving. Like he was leaving. He had a train in an hour. Yeah. Yeah. He was going to leave town because like yeah. the cops were on Cause, cause the Cause the heat was on. Yeah. 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 Um, and so he got like caught and take, taken back to prison. Uh, and then tanks. Um, <laughs> I skipped a little bit there. <laughs> a little bit. A wee, you skipped a whole bunch. <laughs> I mean, not really. He gets back to jail. And... So, yeah, he gets caught, gets sent back. Um, you're forgetting, prior to Tanks, that he shows up and Butch is planning this breakout. Like, they had Which everything. Which leads to Tanks. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> it gets to the Tanks. I know. <laughs> I, I know. I skipped it on purpose. Yeah, so, like, well, I mean, he's planning this whole thing, and that's part of, like, the part of the conflict at the end, because, like, you know, uh, Morgan's been out of prison for a while. He gets sent back. Butch had been planning this big breakout, like, you know, getting all these pieces in order. And they had this flower guy that was dropping stuff off to not alert the guard's suspicion. And then Morgan shows up and he's like, hey, we're going to break out of here like tomorrow on Thanksgiving at noon. You know, pass, you know, don't tell anybody, blah, blah, blah. Um, and throughout the course of the scene, like, the they showed this one particular scene with the prison warden with like half of his security force which was like eight people i guess um and they're like yeah we heard from kent that they're planning a big breakout tomorrow at noon did we, that come from kent i thought it came yeah, from the no, other it, dude it, it came from kent like they straight oh, up oh see that's where i did lost yeah. it. i thought like the other guy that was all being sneaky and listening to people and was also talking to the warden i took it that he was the no. one that ratted no they said that kent was he said that they're breaking out. The big thing is, is thank, you know, tomorrow at noon or whatever it was. We hear they have guns, but he doesn't know where they are. Yeah. And he's like, well, if he can find out where they are and get us that information, we'll, you know, we'll cut cut time off his sentence or what have you. Um, and then the big breakout starts. And then well, first they go to church, and church, uh, Jesus gives them guns. That wasn't Jesus. That was that was Butch handing them out. I know, <laughs> but they they hid the guns in the church. Is what I was getting yeah, at. Yeah, they, they hid them in the pews. Um, in the pew pews. Yeah, the pew pews. <laughs> pew 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 pew. Um, but yeah, no, the the breakout starts and you know everything goes to hell. Mm -hmm. um, the riot is in full motion and the warden like oh by the way the we've called the I don't know state state patrol or whatever and they're sending in the tanks. Yeah. Hence the tanks. Tanks, <laughs> and then yeah, tanks start coming in, and blasting away, and Morgan is like, like, 
what's going on? We gotta stop this. And of course, like Kent's like hiding and everything like that. Um, but they had taken hostages and had the some prison of the guards, guards, yeah, prison guards as hostages. And then they were planning on, like I think they they killed one and like shoved him outside and shot him mm-hmm. to tell him like, hey, we're gonna kill more of these guys if you don't back off and let us let us go. Uh, and then while that's going on, Morgan like kind of rushes them all into like a room with a big steel door. So I don't know if he was going down to the the um, solitary confinement or something, but they got him in that. He uh, locks had the gotten door. the keys off of another guard, locks them in that door, and then takes off with the keys, mm-hmm. um, so that they can't get to the. Well, other he he, no- he knocked the dude out that was guarding that door and took the keys from him. Yeah, 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 yeah. And locked him in and then left. Yeah. Uh, and that way they couldn't get to any more guards and, you know, uh, made, made him kill the, anymore. Instantly made him the hero of the story. Yeah. So they were able to stop the, the you know, the riot and everything. And then because Morgan uh, had protected all of them, they are like, oh, well, cool. Well, we'll let you go back out again. Um, and Full he got, pardon. Full yeah. governor pardon. Yeah. And uh, he got released. Um, and then, like... While like as he's like right before he's getting released, they're they're talking about like let him go, and they uh, they said something along the lines like he prevented an orgy of murder. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like not a, not a word I've used with murder before, but you know it's it's an orgy of wanton violence. <laughs> One thing you skipped over was um, during the riot scene, like uh, they showed Kent the Kent Marlowe the the first first dude in the story, um like kind of hold up with with those yeah the the guards or whatever and then he kind of slips out and goes with another group um morgan locks the door and then goes and sees him like kind of holds up with with them trying to get out of the line of fire um and then kent like freaks out like because they know i'm the one that ratted him out they Mm -hmm. you know they're coming to get me and then goes and like start banging on the door or something and then gets shot and crossfired then actually show shoots him but he ends up dying right there See, I didn't see that either. Yeah. I saw, so I saw him in the room, and I saw him freak out. And I thought he was freaking out because, like, you know, he's not seen Morgan since the knife incident. And he was freaking out because Morgan is like, Morgan's going to want to get back at me because I'm the one that got him in trouble with that knife in the bed. And he ran off. I didn't see the shooting thing because I was probably writing fucking notes again. Yeah, like, I need to start pausing while I write yeah, notes. Yeah, no, like, they, they showed him he was, like, trying to unlock a door. And then, like, he was pounding on his door just trying to unlock it. And then you hear, like, this bang, and he just kind of, like, falls over. Yeah, I did not see that at all. I had to have been writing notes, which makes more sense now because one of the notes I had is like, so Morgan gets out, he like reunites with Anne, uh, and you know, they're in love and, and it's all about Morgan and Anne and Anne no longer gives a shit about Kent. Fuck Kent. He, I'm loving Morgan credits. Yeah. End of the movie. <laughs> and like, see, like I he, didn't see Kent die. Yeah. So again, I would still say like, does she not want to have a fucking funeral for her brother? Uh, but that makes a little more sense why he's not mentioned again. Like I said, I didn't see any of that. And I'm just like, why the fuck does she not care about her brother anymore? It, it may have been a significant amount of time before he got the, the governor pardon for his actions during the riot. True. Because, I mean, it's not like, you know, the day after. Like, hey, you did good. You know, you're gone. I mean, because the, the prison was destroyed. It's going to take time to fix all that stuff and get everything back up to running. True. Yeah. Oh, uh, final thoughts about the big house. It was fine. Um, I mean, You're like, it was fine. It was fine. I mean, it was it was good for a watch. I'm I'm not I'm not a. Um, it's I'm I you know honestly if I never if, if it's if it's a while before I see Chester Morris in a movie again I'll be happy, <laughs> just because he's been in seemingly everything that we watch. Like three or four of the movies we watched. Um, no, it was it was uh, I I enjoyed it enough. Um, I have no no qualms with it. It was enjoyable. Um, not probably something I'm gonna run out of my way to go watch again anytime soon but it was fun so with that in mind you had um all quiet on the western front which was the oscar winner and they watched the divorcee and the big house i feel like i know what your answer is going to be but i'm going to ask anyway because that's the part of this podcast do you feel that the oscars got it right or was the not one of the nominees that we watched a better film uh i'm they absolutely got it right with all quiet on the western front fantastic movie i absolutely loved it they were 100 percent on point with this cool um, I was on the fence between All Quiet on the Western Front and The Divorcee, specifically for the fact that both of them got such a, an emotional response out of me, but I did lean more to saying that, yes, this year the Oscars got it right, All Quiet on the Western Front was the better of the three films. That, that's my, yeah, 
I completely agree. That's my hot take. <laughs> Not that hot. <laughs> you heard it here first, 99 years later. <laughs> they got it right. We agree. Or wait, I just said 99. You Sorry. Did. Let me try that again. 93 years later. <laughs> Math is hard. By the time this comes out, 94 years later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Something later. Some number. Later. It was a long time. <laughs> All right. So the companion to doing the Oscars is the box office. Yes. Uh, so we're going to, the next time uh, we release is going to have, we're going to watch the, the highest earning box office film for 2030. Or 2030. 1930. 2030. We're going into the future. <laughs> Numbers are fucking me up right now. We 1930. Are... Oh, no, no, no. 20, 2030. <laughs> We're going into the future. We're watching Spider-Man 7. Um, okay, so for 1930, the, the, the box office winner was Whoopi, which is a Western sheriff Bob Wells is preparing to marry Sally Morgan. Uh, she loves part Indian Waninus. Waninus? Mm-hmm. Sally flees with hypochondriac Henry Williams, who thinks he's just giving her a ride, but she left a note saying they've eloped. Chasing them are jilted Bob, Henry's nurse Mary, who's been trying to seduce him, and others. Okay. So we have to watch that because that was the highest earner. Okay. Here are some of our options we can choose from. We have check and double check, which makes me think of the discount double check, uh, which is an Amos and Andy storyline uh, where the boys are trying to make a go of their open air taxi business. I'm doing a hard veto on this because I saw the cover of it. Oh, it's straight up blackface the whole yep. time. Nope, don't want to so watch. So hard it. veto. Don't want to watch this. If y'all want to, you all go ahead. And I'm. I'll pass. Yeah. Um, Hell's Angels. Which is brothers Monty and Ray leave Oxford to join the Royal Flying Corps. Ray loves Helen. Helen enjoys an affair with Monty. Uh, before they leave on their mission over Germany, they find her in still another man's arms. Good lord. Yep. <laughs> then we have uh, Min and Bill. The owner of a dockside hotel is forced to make a difficult decision about the future of Nancy, the young woman she took in as an infant. Okay. We have Song Oh My Heart, <laughs> uh, Broken Hearts in Ireland. Sean is a great tenor in semi-retirement, living in a village close to Mary, the woman he's always loved. Mary's aunt convinced her to marry a man for his money, He's uh, who has recently deserted her, leaving her penniless. Okay. And then we have Son of the Gods. Uh, Sounds a, epic. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Um <laughs> A Chinese posing as an American goes to Monte Carlo, where he falls in love with Alana, who later goes berserk upon learning his true identity. I've heard of that, actually. That's that's really? one of the first movies that had to deal with um, racial prejudices. Really? Hmm. Um, the Dawn Patrol. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. World War I ace Dick Courtney derides the leadership of his superior officer, but Courtney is soon promoted to squadron commander and learns harsh lessons about sending subordinates to their deaths. That one was a remake of another of an earlier film called Night Commander or Flight Commander, if I remember correctly. Um, actually, from what I was looking at this, um, the, the Dawn Patrol is just like um, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front has been made multiple times. Right, right. right. Um, there is a Dawn Patrol that was made in 1938. I know it there is was a sequels. remake of the 1931. Got it. But the Dawn Patrol is based off of a book that called may have, Flight Commander. That may have been one of those things. And yeah. when the 1938 version came out, uh, the people who made that, I think, eventually um, the company, like in like the 40s, I think, got the rights to the 1931 too, and changed the name of it to the Flight. Oh, uh, okay, Commander. okay, that makes sense. Okay. Um. Yeah. But anyway, so those are our options. Okay. Um, tell you what, since I apparently picked the last two and completely forgot about it, why don't you pick these two? <laughs> um, well, we've already said no to that. Um, I don't really want more of the love stuff. I would prefer to avoid something that's all about hatred because of skin color. Um, Hell's Angels and the Dawn Patrol. Perfect. Excellent. All right, so that is your assignment before the next 
uh, podcast if you want to follow along. We're watching Whoopi from 1930, Hell's Angels, and The Dawn Patrol from 1930, not yeah, the 1938. 1930, version. very important. Uh, and then we will be back to discuss our thoughts on those three flicks and which we thought was the better of the three. And then we'll end that podcast with saying which was the better for that year of 1930, box office or um, Oscars. Got it. So that would be between Whoopi and um, All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, cool. So, but until then, I'm Jeffrey. I'm Anthony. Catch you at the movies.